almost got into a fight with um, two of them. The funny thing is, is that the show, when you watch it, is like, it's like a weird acid trip. Dutch Mantel called me and he was like, hey man, you want to come to India? We're, we're, we're going to go do a show in India. And, you know, like, you're, you're going to be honest. I said, oh, great, cool. When's that? And I said, what is it? Like a toy? He said, no, no, no. He said, it's like, a, it's like a whole separate TV show. And he sort of gives me the rundown and, and basically says, like, yeah, it's going to be like this big TV network over there called Colors. One of the prime ministers, one of their sons uh, was a big wrestling fan. And he was wrestling with his little brother and broke his neck. And then they took wrestling off TV for a while there. They, they were basically paying for the show. So TNA were basically, you know, it was found money for the company and they could, and Jeff had been put in charge of it and basically could use whoever he wanted, but they wanted, they, but the whole point of the show was that they wanted to, to find and, and groom and create a bunch of Indian stars. So it's kind of like, you know, most of these guys have never wrestled before. So they were trained by uh, Savio Vega and Eugene. And then um, they asked me and Nunzio to uh, work with them before the shows because they're selling and stuff like that, uh, you know, was it up to par. And so, um, so like I, like myself, uh, the Bollywood boy, Zima, and uh, Nunzio would train them before shows. We're talking about like serious TV too. It wasn't like on some little poxy channel. I mean, like the first episode had like 18 million viewers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, we've got to take these complete rookies and sort of make them look like they know what they're doing. And I mean, they were, I mean, they were shocking. Road Dog um, and Sanjay went there and did open tryouts. Uh, I think they did three of them across the country. And uh, and then that's how they got selected. But a lot of the guys that got booked weren't, didn't work for TNA. Like they were, you know, so like Trevor and um, Gallows and all these guys, they, you know, so it was interesting. So it was kind of cool as well because it was all these sort of new faces and it was like, because they pretty much said, okay, here's, here's a bunch of money, make this show. And Jeff had then had to go to TNA and say, okay, I want this guy, I want this guy, I want this guy. And they basically said, okay, you can have him, you can have him, you can't have him, you can't have him. You know. And obviously I was one of the ones they went, oh yeah, you can have him. India is a huge market though, you know what I'm saying? Like, it could, it could really, uh, you know, if there was a wrestling company that was focused there, I'm sure it would do well. Shove it squad for the final ever time. If your girl's in the room, send her out. Because I'm about to make her sing. It's Rinka King. I always said I'd do it and finally it's done. This is all my Rinka King episodes combined into one. And also all your questions answered by Magnus and Jimmy Rave. Don't worry guys, he took it seriously. He didn't party, he behaved. I learned a lot from these guys about the show. So keep watching, I promise it doesn't blow. I want to give a quick shout out to Bernard Binder who's the amazing guy who made my Rinka King artwork. And yes, yes, these two interviews are parts of larger interviews over on my Patreon. Now let's get it on. The Indian wrestling market is something that both WWE and TNA were desperate to tap into, and WWE still is today. The Indian people love their professional wrestling, and it's a ginormous country of a population of 1.35 billion, so it only makes sense that a wrestling company would like to profit from the Indian market. So today we'll be travelling back to 2012 when TNA decided to make a serious attempt to run a second TV programme over in India, and this is how Rinka King was born. The programme would be an action-packed 45 minutes of wrestling and it would be broadcast on the Colours TV network, which is owned by... Ugh, Viacom. Great. So that means this video is going to get taken down as well then. Most of the wrestlers on this show are either signed to TNA or they're American indie wrestlers. There's also lots of unknown Indian wrestlers on this show who received training at OVW before this show took place, so we're going to see how they get on as well. The most exciting thing about this show is that from the four episodes I've watched so far, it seems that Scott Steiner is the main heel on the show. That's it, I'm sold already. So the show starts out with a really long dancing and singing performance from an Indian R&B musical artist called Micah Singh. I've never heard of him before, but he seems to be quite popular with the audience. The set here looks really nice, it's bright and flashy, it's exactly what you would expect to see from an Indian show. In fact it looks a lot nicer than the Impact Zone, they even have their own Nitro Girls, although they're not quite as provocative. 
You know what? I'm quite pumped for this show. Let's see what Rinka King's got to offer. So the very first wrestler we see is uh, Chavo Guerrero. As usual, he says he's here to be the world champion, just like he does every time he goes to a new company. In fact, there's a whole host of wrestlers that you'll recognize from American wrestling programs. Eugene is here playing a wrestler called Dr. Nick Dinsmore. His gimmick is like something that you would expect to see in the early 90s. Dead cheesy and stupid. Sir Brutus Magnus, Scott Steiner, Matt Morgan, Sanjay Dutt, and there's also Mahabali Vera. There's going to be an eight-man tournament to crown the first ever Rinka King World Champion. For some reason, they say that Matt Morgan is the favourite, although he's never actually been a world champion anywhere before. Mahabali Vera wins his first match, and he seems to be the crowd favourite here. They're billing him as the Indian Superman. It may only be the first show, but there's already a heel faction. Brutus Magnus Steiner and Sanjay Dutta are a faction for some reason. Magnus tries to be the serious talker of the group, but Steiner's already the highlight of the show for me. You're gonna kill Morgan! You go out there and destroy him! You hear that? Yeah. DESTROY HIM! Come on, Magnus! Chris Adonis, aka Chris Masters, is also on the show. He's putting up a load of Indian rupees for audience members to come and try and break his Adonis lock. I have to say he looks in a lot more impressive shape than when he turned up in TNA a few years later. Matt Morgan beat Magnus with the carbon footprint in a tournament matchup which ends the first episode of Rinka King and at the end of the show there's a face off with the Hills squaring off with Morgan and Shearer. Sanjay Dutt squaring up to them looks a bit silly really, he's tiny. This tournament is going to continue over the course of the next three episodes ending in the crowning of the first ever Rinka King world champion. Throughout these shows they keep showing this big guy who's an enforcer for the commissioner and it turns out he's in NXT nowadays teaming with Rinku Singh. I'm not going to try and pronounce his name because I can't, no offence, but that's pretty cool. It's quite fun to see what stars have come out of a 2012 Indian wrestling show that was put on by TNA. I expect to see a few more familiar faces as this video progresses. Chavo Guerrero comes out and talks about Eddie, just like he normally does, and says that he'll be the first Rinka King champion. Hopefully not. He's then interrupted by a team called the Sheiks. One of them is Sheik Abdul Bashir. They attack Chavo because they're not very nice guys, I guess. Can't see any other reason than that. Disclaimer, I only speak passable Hindi, so I only know a little bit about what's going on on this show. There's no subtitles either. But this is still watchable for me because there's a lot of promos cut in English still. Backstage, Magnus is talking about the boss and tells Steiner and Sanjay that they have to win their matches. Steiner flips out backstage and I have no idea what he says. Magnus looks terrified. Sanjay isn't speaking English in any of his promos, so his partners just look confused. It's weird seeing him as a heel here, you'd think he'd have been a babyface. Next up, Scott Steiner takes on a wrestler called Max B, who has a UFC gimmick. Steiner is going nuts at the crowd and spits at them during the match. He's literally destroying this kid as well. This is my favourite matchup on Rinka King so far, it's just Steiner throwing this jobber around. I have to mention this flatliner he hits from the top rope. It looks like he kills this kid. He then taps the kid out with the Steiner recliner. Scott continues to attack the kid after the show and puts him in the recliner but won't let go and he keeps screaming at everybody. This is like WCW all over again. During the break Steiner attacks the kid on the stretcher and then he suplexes him from the top. Man we didn't get Steiner acting like this in TNA, this is awesome. It's just like his roid rage gimmick in WCW. Talking of flipping out, the Sheiks are backstage complaining about something but I don't know what they're talking about. Because Abdul Bashir speaks so many languages, I don't know which one he's actually doing here, but it's not English, that's for sure. For anyone who's watched Rinka King, the Mumbai Cats are probably one of the most infamous teams to come out of the show, and they'll be taking on the Sheiks next. For some reason, the Sheiks have Raisha Saeed with them, so we continue to see all the TNA talents that they didn't have anything better to do turn up on this show. The Sheiks go on to have the best wrestling match of Rinka King so far. I love their double team moves, especially their finisher. They worked a great old school heel matchup here, and the crowd loved the Mumbai Cats. I'm not going to pretend that I understand the Hindi culture too much, but the fans did love the Mumbai Cats, and the gimmick might seem a bit bizarre to anyone who's watching this from outside India. It might even seem silly to some, but listen, we were not the target audience for this show, so it doesn't really matter what we think, as long as the fans are entertained. Anyway, the Mumbai Cats lose after the Sheiks do a double team from the top rope. Backstage, a team called the Bollywood Boys are being interviewed. Okay, I just had to look it up. Both of these guys are actually from Canada and they're currently signed to WWE. So that's another good thing that's already come out of this show. Next up, Sanjay Dutt and Chavo fight in another tournament match. In a surprising twist, Chavo Guerrero actually loses the match to Sanjay Dutt after the Sheiks run out and distract him. It's quite hilarious. Everywhere Chavo Guerrero goes, he talks a big game and then instantly fails. 
The show ends with Magnus talking to the boss on the phone again. It sounds like the aim of this tournament is to have a Steiner vs Sanjay Dutt final, as whoever the boss is, he or she wants them to be able to control Rinka King. This storyline continues into the next show, and it's lots of talk about the boss. Scott Steiner calls the Indian wrestlers a bunch of white trash in a particular highlight of the show. You understand what he's saying, white trash? You made a big mistake! In fact, this show would be particularly notable for Scott Steiner. He comes out to the ring in a rage. I mean, seriously, look at him. I don't know what wound him up so much before this match, but he looks scary. I've watched this footage back time and time again. I read some people say that the fans spat at Scott Steiner, but honestly, I can't see any sign of that. Steiner turns into a raging bull trying to get at the fans. He tries to get over the barrier and he has one fan around the neck. He's basically crushing him. He starts screaming at Magnus and the referee. Nobody can control him here. It looks like they've moved him along, but then he turns on some more fans and starts trying to get at them as well. Magnus looks absolutely terrified here. I bet he's thinking, what have I got myself in for? I don't know what set off Scott here. All I can see is a fan pointing at him on the way to the ring. I mean, let me know down below. Do you think that incident was real or fake? I don't see how that many fans can be plants in the audience. It seemed like everyone in the audience was terrified. Regardless of what happened with Scotty then, he's taken on Mahabali Vera next in another tournament match and I would not like to be Vera with the mood that Scott Steiner seems to be in. Scott Steiner eventually manages to beat Mahabali Vera. I really did think Vera was being built up to be the face of the company, so it surprised me to see him lose to Steiner here. Scott Steiner is now through to the finals of the competition. This must have been Scott Steiner's final main event run in a major company, if you can call Rinka King that, I guess it would be going by their viewing figures. Backstage some wrestlers are being interviewed, it's Zima Ion, Jimmy Rave and Cowboy Trevor Murdoch. Apparently they're all going to be involved in a six man tag match next. Jimmy Rave is just embarrassing on the mic, it's so cringy to listen to him. And Trevor Murdoch just sounds like he's reading from James Storm's playbook. It's Jimmy Rave and I'm ready to get this match over with so we can party! Woo! Bottom line is, I like to drink beer and fight. And when we step into the ring tonight, we're gonna kick some freaking teeth down somebody's throat. So you better lace them up tight. The first opponent that they will be taking on is an Undertaker ripoff because they were unable to get the real Undertaker on the show. He's called Isaiah Cash. It's actually Luke Gallows and he teams up with Joey Ryan and Nunzio here. Zima Ion lights up the ring here and he wins it for his team with the flashiest offence the Indian fans would have seen on Rinka King up to this point. After the match, Gallows attacks everybody and hits a choke bomb. Man, I love that move. He then cuts a promo about not messing with his colours or his bike. Kind of a prelude to the Aces and Eights as around 8 months after this, he would end up in TNA as a mass biker. He then attacks his partners after the match. Chris Adonis is also continuing with his master lock challenge, but in typical TNA fashion, a midget randomly runs out to the crowd and gets involved, because TNA always has to involve midgets on their show. In the other semi-final tournament match, Matt Morgan beats Sanjay Dutt. Sanjay was surprisingly competitive against the much larger Matt Morgan here. The final has now been confirmed, and it will be Scott Steiner taking on Matt Morgan. Uh, the first match that we did was the match with me, uh, Trevor and Zima. Uh, and like, that was the first match that they saw. And so we, you know, like we're, we're thinking, oh man, we gonna, we need to go out there and give them like almost like an X division type style match, but they were set. They hadn't seen wrestling so much that some of that went over their head. You know what I mean? And so like, they really, we really had to be super cut and dry with it. And so the, sim the more simple things that we did, the better. The Ring King fans also get to see some female wrestling action as Mickey James beats Alyssa Flash in a highly competitive matchup. The Indian fans love Mickey James. I'm surprised TNA allowed Mickey to turn up here. Next up, there's a press conference and there's a weigh in between Steiner and Morgan. Steiner has his biceps measured and they come out at 24.5 inches. He will not stop bringing this up for the promo. He's absolutely gushing about this. Matt Morgan's biceps weren't as big, sadly. Pretty fun little segment. I'm quite pumped for this tournament final. Backstage, the Bollywood boys announced that there's going to be a tournament to crown the first ever Rinka King Tag Team Champions. I'm quite interested to see what these guys have got. 
Chavo Guerrero continues to feud with the Sheiks and on this show he teams up with David Hart Smith. I was quite surprised to see the British Bulldog's son turn up on this show from 2012, as just two years earlier he was the unified tag team champion in WWE. He fell from grace quickly. During the match there's more rubbish with the midget. I don't know why you keep showing up on the show, I really don't know what's going on with this. Matt Morgan and Steiner eventually clash in the main event and it's a pretty good match. The crowd are firmly behind Morgan and it went for a good 10 minutes. This was also the first match I'd seen where the crowd were clearly chanting an American wrestler's name throughout. Morgan eventually beat Steiner to pick up the win and become the first ever Ring King world champion. So to all you Matt Morgan fans out there, this will be Morgan's biggest achievement in the wrestling business right here. I think it was a good choice to have Matt Morgan win the belt and become the first champion, as it starts this company off on a good point, but from a selfish point of view, man I would have loved it if Steiner was the first ever champion. The more Steiner TV time we get the better. So the Scott Steiner incident with the fan was fun to watch and it looked a bit crazy, but I do actually have to confess that in a later episode of Rinker King, he would go one step further. He would rip at the barriers and chase the fans. This really got me thinking if this was staged or not, but how can you get so many fans involved in something like that? How could they all be plants? What an awesome spectacle to see though, all those people sprinting in terror from the raging bull that is Scott Steiner. Scott Steiner was actually signed to TNA at this point, but upon return from Rinker King, he would be fired by TNA, so I guess they didn't think much of his attack in the crowd gimmick. So that's the first four episodes of Rinker King. There were 26 episodes in total, and the wrestling is actually really good. It's basically TNA wrestling with less talking segments. Some other familiar TNA faces would turn up as the weeks went on, but unfortunately the show wasn't actually picked up for a second series, despite getting pretty good viewership. I mean, just to put this viewership stuff into perspective, the first ever episode of Rinker King got 14 million viewers. That's a lot of people. That makes WWE look tiny. I laughed so hard on that phone when you said, like, Magnus looks terrified. <laughs> I meant it. You did. <laughs> well, you know, I wasn't terrified. I mean, that part of the, I wasn't terrified. Like, that's for sure. I was like, enjoy, I was loving it. I wasn't afraid of it. I liked it. You know, I was into it. But uh, n no. So it's my understanding that the audience at Rinker King were paid like extras or whatever, but they, but they weren't like, they weren't like, not that I'm, if it happened, I never saw it. They were never directed or produced in any way. I think they were just like, look, and I'm, and I'm going to try to tread carefully the way I say this, but my guess is that a lot of them were probably just excited to get paid to do something like that, to you know, because it, because you know, money didn't come that easy for a lot of them, maybe. And I think so. For a lot of them, they were just like, wait, you're going to pay me to go and watch a <laughs> well, yeah. So then they were like excited, you know. What I mean, like, it's like win-win, and they said, and they and they, and it's to the best of my knowledge, this was the first time that it was their own pro wrestling show. So I think there was certainly a bit of a, a bit of um, patriotism in, in that crowd as well, in the sense of like, holy shit, like we've got our own pro wrestling show with American stars. You know, you have to understand for like. A lot of these people, you know, that that would seem like such a far away thing. So to see Scott Steiner, who was like part of like the biggest boom period of the business, and he's coming out, and you know, like I can, I'm sure that for a lot of them, it was like that. And I think it's just that, not to mention the fact that uh, they really went all out on the promotion. I mean, there were billboards and fucking huge billboards like all over the place. You know, and most of them were featuring Scott. So it was like, he was sort of, he he was the biggest star, no doubt. And he was the one who Jeff had sort of really asked for. Because, you know, obviously Jeff and Scott are tight. And like, so he was the one who Jeff had really said, look, I need one, I need one real bona fide star to sort of, you know, to make this thing work. And they said, hey, take Steiner. And he loved it. He's been around in like the boom period of the business. And now he's pretty much just doing the impact zone where it's the same fans every, every other week and they're good, but they're, you know, they're, they're pretty entitled, you know, and they're pretty like, awesome. meh, meh, meh. so he gets to go to this place and they're like losing their minds and they're terrified of him. So he's like, Scott's like a big kid. He's a big jock, you know, like he, he genuinely is just like a big, like high school jock. So like in his mind, he's like, Oh great. I can fuck with these people. 
And he just, and then once he realized, like he, you know, he did his usual, like mess with people in the crowd thing. He's been doing that his whole career. But he did it in India and like 20 people like ran for their lives. So they didn't know, they had no idea what was going to happen. And as soon as that happened, I just saw his eyes. Like, I was like, oh boy. And then that was it after that. He just, okay, if that's what happens when I just like, just faint like a little, you know, just do a faint backhand at someone. Like, imagine what happens if I get on the rail. Sure enough, like part like the Red Seas. And then he's like, I'll jump the rail. You know, the next thing you know, he's like shaking the thing. You know, <laughs> it's like. Well, you know, like we got, we flew out of Atlanta, right? And I remember um, there was like a whole bunch of military guys on our flight, right? And I'm, I'm uh, waiting for them to board the plane. And Scott comes up and every one of those military guys stopped what they were doing and like stared at Scott Steiner. And then they like stared at me. Cause like Scott comes up to me. He's like, are they boarding yet? And I said, no, he goes, all right, well text me when they start boarding. I was like, all right. And they're all looking at me like, how the fuck do you know this guy? You know what I mean? Like, and Scott, uh, literally when they started boarding, they hadn't called our section yet. And Scott just cut in line gave him the ticket and left and then they had um tv cameras to catch our us coming out the airport uh scotty took his shirt off you know what i'm saying and like uh and got in his cab when we were staying at the hotel you know like they kind of catered uh lunch and dinner but like breakfast we all kind of like ate at the restaurant at the hotel and he ordered an omelet and the guy could not figure out what an omelet was and Scott Steiner went in there and made his own omelet. And I was like, this guy just does whatever the fuck he wants, man. It's crazy. All right, Shove It Squad. My last Rinker King video seemed to go over pretty well. And I'm glad a lot of you enjoyed seeing Scott Steiner being pushed as a main eventer. Well, get ready to be disappointed. You won't believe what they've got in store for him over the next four episodes of Rinker King. Just before we start, make sure you hit subscribe and that bell icon or the hawk gets it. And make sure to let me know down below if you want this series to continue, covering Rinker King or not. Alright, let's do it. Episode 2 Rinker King. Did it make the Steiner sing? Let's find out. Alright, starting out, I don't know quite why we need these two authority figures on the show. We've got this ex-cricketer guy who seems to be obsessed with shaking people's hands, and then we've got this other dude called Jazzy Lahoria. I've no idea what he's saying here, but he's giving off serious hill vibes. His title is the Commissioner, so he's basically the Indian William Regal. He announces that the tag title tournament is taking place now. All the competitors come out, like they did to introduce the main characters in the World Championship tournament. No sign of Steiner here. I wonder what the world's most random faction, Steiner, Magnus and Sanjay Dutt will be up to tonight. All the competitors start fighting. Zima Ion hits a big dive onto all of them, but it looks like nobody manages to catch him properly. He then celebrates with Jimmy Rave. Whatever you do, don't let him near a mic. Backstage, a man who looks homeless is walking around. I think he's supposed to be intimidating, but he just looks scruffy. He starts threatening people backstage. This army dude called the Enforcer then squares up to him and immediately devalues him by dwarfing him in size. The scruff ball comes out to the ring next. What is wrong with him? He looks like he's been punched in the face. He seems to be doing an abyss gimmick. His opponent is an overweight man with a ninja gimmick. He's the fattest ninja I've ever seen. Maybe he was one of the ones who kidnapped Samoa Joe. Wait a minute, that's Savio Vega. What the hell happened to him? Anyway, the scruffy guy wins with a finger to the throat. It looks bad. Backstage, the Steiner faction is apologising to their boss on the phone for not winning the world title and begging for him not to send somebody to help them. Sonjay is acting like a cartoon character here. Suddenly, Steiner goes nuts and says he wants control and hates Rinker King and other things that I don't quite understand. You tell me. I don't have control! I'm Rinker King! I want fear again! I want any Indian again! I want to destroy! I hate these people! Send me anybody! I'm gonna destroy them! And hopefully Steiner will follow through with that promise and destroy someone tonight. The Sheiks come out for their tag tournament match next. Everyone yelled at me on the last video for not pointing out that along with Davari, his nephew Ari Davari is also signed with the WWE right now and competes in the cruiserweight division. Anyway, the Sheiks beat two fake looking Indian strongmen. Now the midget is back on TV again for some reason. He actually has more swag than most people on this show put together though. Magnus and Sanjay Dutt take on Zima Ion and Jimmy Rave next. 
Zemo was great last week, but he's too skinny to be wearing a vest like that, even if it is extra small. I don't understand a spot in this match. Sanjay Duck kisses Jimmy Ray's boot and it seems to get a massive pop from the crowd. Maybe someone can explain this one to me below. Magnus looks like a proud father beating up his little children here. They're also small compared to him. Sanjay and Magnus eventually win when Magnus hits the elbow from the top. Steiner then comes out to celebrate but doesn't beat anyone up sadly, so they lied to us then. The tag team tournament continues on the next show. The Bollywood boys come out to a big elaborate entrance with dancing but nobody cares about them because they're taking on the Mumbai Cats. Interestingly it's been heavily rumoured on this channel that the Mumbai Cats are actually the young bucks in disguise. <laughs> This is the first matchup involving no talents that would have been familiar to any of you at the time. It's a nothing match and the Bollywood boys win with a double super kick. Backstage the new world champion is being interviewed about the main event tonight between Isaiah Cash and Roscoe Jackson for the number one contendership. Wow I know Morgan was a giant but how small is that interviewer compared to him? This match was set up a couple of weeks ago when Isaiah Cash attacked everyone after a tag match. Roscoe is jumped on his way to the ring by the homeless looking man and Cash takes advantage of this by booting him square in the face. Roscoe is then in control of the match for a very long time until Isaiah Cash hits a spine buster out of nowhere to pin him for the free, a standard big man match. Backstage the Steiner, Magnus and Sanjay Duck crew are on Skype being threatened by their boss. It's obvious who their boss is from the voice but it doesn't show a picture. Take a guess down below in the comments section who you think the boss will be. If you've already seen Rinky King, don't spoil it for everyone else, otherwise you're going to be in trouble, this is Rob Terry rules remember. He keeps saying he wants control and threatens them and says that they can't lose any more matches. Backstage the authority figures are being interviewed again. Why does this guy feel the need to shake everybody's hand and tell them to keep up the great work? It just sounds so patronising. It sounds like that one boss at work who just keeps interfering with what you're doing, you just don't want to deal with them. Then the midget appears again and starts ranting about something, no idea what he's American Adonis is then doing the challenge again to see who can beat his master lock. He beats some crowd member again in seconds, but this time Mahabali Vera comes out and interrupts him and challenges him, but Adonis backs down. Chavo Guerrero is being interviewed next about his upcoming tag team tournament match, but his voice is like nails on a chalkboard. I can't stand this guy, it's probably how most of you feel about me. Anyway, Bulldog Hart and Chavo are taking on Joey Ryan and Nunzio in this tag tournament matchup. You know, I hate all this ass kissing Chavo gets wherever he goes. He's nothing special. He was a jobber in WCW and a jobber in WWE. The only thing special about him is who he was related to. He's small, he can't cut a promo, and all he's ever done is reference his uncle. Name me one interesting thing he's done since Eddie passed away. And no, Glow doesn't count. There's just nothing likeable about him. At least people like Rob Terry and Wes Briscoe were so bad that they were funny. Chavo isn't even bad in the ring, so it's not funny. In the match, Chavo is isolated for ages, but eventually he tags into Bulldog Hart Smith, who nails a powerbomb, before Chavo wins with the frog splash because God hates me. On the next episode of Rinker King, Isaiah Cash brags on the mic that he is the leader of a motorcycle club. Makes me wonder if the Aces and Eights were planned to start a bit sooner than they actually did. He calls out Matt Morgan, but Matt Morgan gets attacked by the homeless man on the way to the ring. You know, they really should put some security there if he's going to keep doing that. Either that or slip the guy some rupees and get rid of him. Anyway, Morgan fights him off, it's not a big deal. But then Cash nails him with the world title. Backstage, Magnus is threatening Sanjay Dutt that they need to win their tag tournament match tonight. Sanjay is being a complete goof and not taking it seriously until Steiner flips out at him. Elsewhere, Mickey James is being threatened by Raisha Saeed, but there's no time for that because the homeless man is back up next. I think he's meant to be like a monster cane or a bis gimmick, but he's not scary looking. He just looks stupid. He's taking on an obese Indian child. This is the fattest eight year old I've ever seen. I'm not even exaggerating, have you ever seen such a fat child? What did his parents feed him? Anyway, the homeless man jabs the fat boy in the neck with his finger and pins him in about 20 seconds. He then gets on the mic throwing a tantrum that he wants a world title shot. Do you really think that you deserve a world title shot? All you did was beat up a fat child. The commissioner comes out next with some backup, all of which look like they could take this homeless guy quite easily. The commissioner then suspends him and the security remove him from the arena. I'm not surprised he got suspended, he assaulted and bullied a very fat child. It was pure abuse. Magnus and Sanjay Dutt are out next and they will be taking on the Bollywood boys. The Bollywood boys are two of the better Indian talents that I've seen so far on this show and the crowd are nuts about them. 
They hit their double super kick finish on Sanjay, but he kicks out this time because he's not a cat. Dutt and Magnus eventually manage to win after Magnus nails the elbow from the top rope. Chavo is then being interviewed backstage again, but he's interrupted by the midget and a giant. They want a title shot if Chavo can win the belts. Chavo is all scared of the giant. Talking of giants, Morgan is backstage moaning about everyone attacking him tonight. He threatens Cash for hitting him with the belt. The Sheiks are out next to take on Chavo Guerrero and Bulldog Hart for a place in the final. During the match, Raisha Saeed tries to interfere, but Mickey James stops her, and Bulldog Hart hits the power slam with Chavo following up with the frog splash, and they're in the final. Episode 8 starts out with Morgan hyping his world title match tonight against Isaiah Cash. The Magnus Steiner Sanjay Dutt faction are backstage trying to recruit Isaiah Cash to join their team, said they'll help each other win their matches tonight. Steiner is offering the guy fruit. Why have they completely ruined Scott Steiner in the space of four shows? He was a complete badass main eventer before this. Now he's serving this bold Undertaker rip-off jobber with fruit. What happened? Why? Bagal Parinda is out next. He's one of the new talents we haven't seen yet, but he seems to think he's a hawk. There's only one Hawk Hogan, brother, and it ain't you. He'll be taking on Jimmy Rave, who probably can't wait to get this match over with so he can go out and party. It's Jimmy Rave, and I'm ready to get this match over with so we can party! Woo! Okay, I'll hold my hands up. I thought this Perinda guy was going to be bad. He's actually very agile. He puts Jimmy Rave away over Moonsault. He seems to be a jobber no matter what continent he's on. The world title match is up next, and as usual, Matt Morgan is the firm fan favourite. Not sure why this match isn't going on last tonight. Probably because Cubo isn't very good and he's not actually a main eventer. This match is quite enjoyable for two big guys, and it's very back and forth. The match eventually ends when Baldy tries to jump from the top rope, but Matt Morgan nails him in mid-air with the carbon footprint to retain the world title. Suddenly a bunch of jobbers appear on the entrance ramp to clap Matt Morgan. What ass kisses! This former cricket player is out next. He's all over this show. He's basically the Indian Eric Bischoff. He's just here to introduce the competitors for the finals of the tag team title tournament next. God, I hate Chavo. I have a really bad feeling about this match. Then there's this woman announcer. In England, girls are judged by the size of their hoop earrings. The bigger the hoop, the bigger the whore. Well, this woman takes it to a whole new level. It literally looks like she's gone down to the Mombe rubbish tip and picked up pieces of trash to tie to her earlobes. This cricket guy is really annoying me as well. He's completely biased towards the good guys. He loves Chavo and Bulldog Hart. They keep showing him throughout the match, but nobody cares what this guy thinks. Maybe he's some sort of massive celebrity in India like David Beckham. I don't know, but get this guy off my screen now. The heels isolate Chavo for ages here, and this is a very good old school match. Sanjay Dutt actually impressed me here with some of his heel work. Chavo eventually manages to nail Magnus with the drop kick and then can manage to tag out the match. The match then breaks down and Scott Steiner comes out. Deadly Dander, the army dude, stops Steiner from going any further and threatens him with a little stick. So Steiner puts his tail between his legs and leaves. What idiots, this show's completely ruined him. The Steiner of six episodes ago would not have left or be scared of this guy. Why the change? Anyway, Bulldog powerbombs Sanjay and then Chavo hits the frog splash. Or the crossbody drop as the commentary team call it. And here they are, your first Rinka King Tag Team Champions, Bulldog Hart and Chavo Guerrero. Ugh. As the show goes off the air, Scott Steiner is shown backstage frantically apologising on the phone to the boss, who tells him that next week it is coming. What a terrible four episodes that was. They had something special with Steiner here, I'm not exaggerating, it was great. And then they completely ruined it. It's like he was a completely different person. What happened? Did they run out of steroids to pump him up with? They did a complete 180 on him. He had zero matches in the four episodes that I've reviewed here, and now he's scared and saying sorry to people. I don't get it. And I'm sorry, I can't stand Chavo Guerrero. He was the most featured person on these shows other than the cricket guy. The wrestling continues to be good. There's no interference or bad booking, but it's just a bit dull. This felt closer to a WWE show rather than a TNA show. I think that was one of the things we liked about Rinka King is that none of us, for the first time, like none of us cared about how we were booked. Like none of us sit there going like, oh my God, I'm getting buried. Because it was like, we didn't care because it was, it's like, it's, it's Indian television. You know what I mean? It was, it, and so it was really refreshing, which was ironic because obviously it was like, I was booked well and I was like, booked well, sort of. Um, and my guess is they probably just were worried that Scott, like they just, you know, they didn't want to even have to ask him to do that. So I don't think it was ever even discussed 
you know, the because like when you look at it, do you think why wouldn't they make Scott Steiner the champion? Like, you know, he was like by far away the biggest attraction and like the biggest star and like place went nuts and he was like causing riots like when he came out, which was legit. Like those were, you know, that he did like he just, but he didn't tell anyone he was going to do any of that when he went out into the crowd. My, like I said, my guess is that they they probably just wanted him to keep doing that and not have to not have to worry about having to go, hey, Scott, do you think you could do the do the honors for this guy who's literally had two matches? You know? <laughs> like... It's because of you, Hawk Hogan. You know, Briscoe, what the Hawk really wants to know, brother, is you're a badass biker, dude. So like all badass bikers, you got an initiation to the club, brother. So tell the heart, once and for all, how much piss did you take in your face from the aces and eights as they sure did miss from the look of your face? Hawkamania is flying wild on you, Pisco! Hawkamaniacs, it's your favourite time of the month. It's Rinker King time. Our last video ended with the world's most random faction, Magnus, Sanjay Dutt and Steiner, losing in a tag tournament and their boss threatened to send somebody to help them out, while Steiner begged and pleaded on the phone with his boss not to do it. Well, we find out pretty quickly what this is going to be about. I normally put four episodes together, but this one's only going to be three. If you don't like it, then shut up or I'll smack you one. I'm going to review Impact, but in the same format as this video, where I put a bunch of episodes together. I just don't have time to do a weekly review. The gyms have reopened. I'm sorry. Let's get on down. The little interview man is standing in a road and it sounds deserted. There's no screaming Rinker King fans here. Then an ambulance pulls up and the driver is terrified. Inside you can hear someone screaming and crying. And it's... Oh, for God's sake, the idiot abyss has arrived in India. The interviewer asks Sanjay Dutt, what is it? <laughs> abyss is inside screaming and rocking the ambulance like a complete moron. Damn, I've missed this from my Idiot Abyss video. It sounds like I'm gonna have a lot of new proof about how stupid Abyss was. Chris Adonis is out next. He's actually having a match finally. Good, we were all getting tired of the Master Lock Challenge. He will be taking on Roscoe Jackson. I don't think this Roscoe guy's won a single match so far. Adonis dominates the match with a spine buster. I'm having trouble buying into Jackson as a good guy. He just seems like a natural heel. Anyway, Adonis' friend Shearer gets involved from the outside, but not the Shearer you're all thinking of, and the distraction allows Adonis to get Jackson in the master lock, and he passes out from the pain. I have to say, so far this Shearer guy seems like a complete waste of money. Nine episodes and all he's done is carry Adonis' briefcase around. The world's most random faction are backstage. It looks like they've locked Abyss behind a glass door. If he's such a badass, why doesn't he just smash the window down? Alyssa Flash is out next, and she's taking on Raisha Saeed, who is accompanied by the Sheiks. Everyone pointed out in the last two videos that I keep getting it wrong about Aria Davari. They are actually second cousins twice removed. Here we have two women who were booked appallingly by TNA. Both of them were skilled wrestlers, but you wouldn't have known it from their time in TNA. Alyssa Flash is impressive in this match and hits a top rope dropkick. Raisha Saeed then gets straight back up and hits an Umpredier out of nowhere, with zero help from the Sheiks on the outside. A strangely booked short match. The Sheik people all beat Alyssa Flash down, and the Bollywood boys run out to make the save along with Mickey James. The Bollywood boys music is playing. This is a low-key banger, I have to say. Backstage, the midget is with the giant and Dr. Nick Dinsmore. Dinsmore says that he has a special magic pill to give the midget, and it will give him the strength of 10 men. Someone certainly took a lot of pills when they came up with this segment. The midget eats the pill and then looks like he's about to do a dump in his nappy. The authority is backstage talking to Deadly Dander and his security team. No idea what they said. Okay, Nunzio and everyone's favourite Joey Ryan is out next. They will be taking on... Oh god, it's that eight-year-old obese Indian boy from the last video. He got beaten up by a homeless man at the end of the last video, but there's no mention of it here. His partner is a man in tight leather clothing with a rose in his mouth. I can't get over this Indian boy, I'm sorry, I know I laugh about him a lot on these videos, but he's just so funny looking. Joey Ryan can't knock him down because he's too fat. Suddenly the midget runs out and he starts running around the ring and doing forward rolls. 
and then the eight-year-old Indian boy pushes him over. This leather man has a bit of charisma to be fair. However, he gets isolated and he's screwed because his partner is too fat to get back in the ring. He does make the hot tag eventually, and the Indian boy is really throwing his weight around, and there's a lot of it to throw. He tries to get a sneaky pin, but this is reversed by Joey Ryan, who grabs the ropes and pins him back for the free. The two authority figures are being interviewed backstage, and they say that there will be a number one contendership battle royal. The Magnus, Sanjay and Steiner faction is out next. Yes, finally a Steiner match, it's only been like five episodes. It's a six-man tag match and they will be taking on Chavo Guerrero and Bulldog Hart. I know, Steiner is attacking the audience again. Man, he really hates this crowd. They will be teaming up with the Rinker King champion, Matt Morgan. Backstage, the cameraman cuts away to show that Abyss has escaped from his glass doors. Maybe he finally did punch a hole in them. Back in the ring, Sanjay Dutt is getting killed, so he tags in Steiner. The moment that everyone has been waiting for. The crowd are all taunting Steiner, trying to make him flip out again. Steiner is too distracted and Bulldog Hart gets the better of him. Chavo is then sent over the top rope by Steiner, who follows him to the outside. This crowd looks like it's at boiling point with Steiner. He nearly goes through the fence at one point. Steiner starts chasing off the referee and the crowd are booing so loudly. Someone please tell me why it isn't Steiner the champion. Chavo is completely isolated by the hills and he's getting worked over. All you can hear is Scott Steiner screaming at the crowd. Chavo eventually catches Sanjay Dutt with a dropkick and he's able to make the tag out to Morgan. Bulldog Hart then gets in the ring and Magnus catches him with a low blow and nails him with a Michinoku driver to get the free. Fair play, wasn't expecting Magnus to get the pin. The fight continues after the bell and then a screaming wolf sound is heard and Abyss appears in the middle of the ring. Abyss hits the choke slam on Matt Morgan. He then hits a black hole slam on Chavo Guerrero and then he gets a second one on Bulldog Hart. Abyss then starts charging at the crowd. He also keeps screaming. He sounds like something from a Godzilla movie. It sounds so wacky and cartoonish. Steiner is jealous of the fun that Abyss is having and wants to join in, so he goes over to the crowd as well. Steiner then breaks into the seating area. Abyss is a complete idiot and Steiner is legit scary. I spoke in the previous video about whether or not the audience were plants, and I have been informed with varying mixed opinions that some of the crowd were paid or all of them were paid. I'm not sure what's true, but I find it hard to believe that every single person in this building was paid. There's loads of them. I know TNA has a poor history of drawing a crowd, but having to pay hundreds of people to turn up seems a bit mad. Anyway, a great episode. On to episode 2. The show starts with Abyss rocking backwards and forwards screaming and a wolf sound effect playing. He looks like he's trying to do sit-ups, but he's too fat. Tonight there will be a 12-man battle royal for the number one contendership for the world title. Can't wait. And Morgan then comes out to hype up the match. Morgan then starts threatening Abyss for attacking him on the last show. And then the two meet up in the middle of the ring. They have a brawl in the ring and Matt Morgan ends up getting choke slammed again. What a world champion we have here. Oh, and then Abyss hits him with the black hole slam for good measure. Abyss leaves him in the ring. And then suddenly, the homeless man appears in the ring. And then he starts beating on Matt Morgan like a coward. And then he celebrates like he did something impressive. Maybe this Matt Morgan world title run in Rinka King is evidence as to why TNA never gave him the belt. The Sheiks and Raisha Saeed will be taking on the Bollywood boys and their banging theme music next. Mickey James will also be teaming up with them in a six person match match and as usual the crowd loved the Bollywood boys, but the Sheiks managed to steal the match. I just can't get over how bad Raisha Saeed's gimmick is. It's somehow worse than her time in TNA. She tries to attack Mickey after the match but the Sheiks drag her away. Mickey gets on the mic and challenges her to a match on the next show. The little interviewer man is backstage with the pointless authority figure when the world's most random faction walk into the office. Magnus says that in a week his boss will be arriving and they threaten him with an ultimatum, but they don't explain what that is. I thought the boss sent Abyss to take care of things for him. Oh for God's sake the cricket guy is on commentary again. I really hope Abyss gives him a black hole slam tonight. It's the battle royal next and Magnus is out first. He will be starting against Max B who is some failed MMA fighter. This guy has done nothing but get beaten down on this show. This seems to basically be a Royal Rumble match with another competitor every 30 seconds. And then the last two will have a one-on-one -on -one match. You know, TNA rules. The next competitor is the obese Indian boy. His punches look so bad. And then Magnus boots him square in the head. Hey, that's child abuse, Magnus. Dr. Nick Dinsmore is out next. The commentary team are talking about Max B's boxing skills as Magnus uppercuts him square in the face. Roscoe Jackson is out next, followed by Romeo Raptor, whose theme music cuts out after about 5 seconds. Still no one has been eliminated. 
Isaiah Cash stomps to the ring next, and he takes everyone out like he's Kane from 1999. He eliminates Romeo Raptor. Isaiah Cash then gets eliminated by Roscoe Jackson, who takes himself out in the process. Chris Adonis is out next, and he works with Dr. Nick Dinsmore, but they still cannot lift up the obese Indian boy. For God's sake, he's about five foot six. The Midget and the Giant are apparently the next competitors in the match. This Giant throws Nick Dinsmore out. Adonis then throws the Midget out, who lands on Dinsmore. The Giant then eliminates himself for some reason. I guess because he loves the Midget so much? Mahabali Vera's music plays, but he's shown beaten up backstage. It's pretty quickly revealed that Abyss did the beating. Steiner charges out to the ring now. It's Suplex City for the poor Indian guys. Next up is someone completely new who looks like a caveman with glasses on. This guy is legitimately big. Oh, he's not wearing glasses, he's painted his eyes like some girl on Saturday night. Steiner throws the Indian jobbers out. Then the big dude throws Steiner out. Adonis and Magnus then start working together, but the man who I have nicknamed Hamburglar throws Adonis out. Magnus then hits him with a Michinoku driver and pins him for the free. That was anticlimactic and sudden. I guess Magnus is the guy now in this group. There were lots of recaps on this episode. Other than the Battle Royal, it wasn't the best. Okay, and now I've saved the best episode for last. It's almost time for the boss to be revealed. The annoying cricket guy comes out because we can't get enough of him on the show every week. No idea what he says. Jazzy Lahoria is then backstage being interviewed, but the world's most random faction walk up to him and say that tonight's the night the boss arrives. Steiner goes nuts and says tonight you better have the right answer. I'm not sure what the question was Steiner. Abyss then does a fake Godzilla scream. Zima Ion is out next for the first match of the night. We haven't seen him for a few episodes. He will be taking on Pagal Perinda, who is an obvious Hawk Hogan ripoff. At this point it's getting serious. He's even got a Hawk screaming at the start of his music. This might be a good match though, and it does start out nicely. This Perinda guy is actually good. I couldn't find out much about him on the internet, but he surely wasn't trained at OVW shortly before the Rink of King shows like much of the other Indian talent. He's way more advanced and athletic than the rest of the guys. Let me know if you know anything about this Hawk imposter's whereabouts, as he's going to get a lawsuit for gimmick infringement. He puts Zima Eye on a way of a moonsault pretty easily. Sanjay Dutt then comes out looking like he's just walked out of a £10 Sports Direct shopping spree. Sanjay threatens and pushes Perinda, so he eats a couple of drop kicks and then rolls to the outside, only for Perinda to splash on top of him. Outside the arena again and a white SUV has just pulled up. And it's Double J. Congratulations to those of you who guessed the boss right. If there's ever a secret reveal in something involving TNA, just guess Jeff Jarrett. You will be correct at least 80% of the time, and the other 20% of the time it will be Sting. The cricket man is talking about what a successful businessman Jeff Jarrett is. Is he insane? I bet he secretly wants to shake Jarrett's hand. Raisha Saeed is out next. One day I might actually get to watch a match where she isn't gimmicked up and I'll probably enjoy it a lot more. Mickey James is her opponent tonight. They've been pretty much feuding since the start of Rinka King. She brings the Bollywood boys with her for backup. Mickey almost pins Raisha in the first few seconds. Mickey then tries to hit a Hurricanrana from the corner, but Raisha reverses it into a powerbomb. Mickey then gets back on top until the Sheiks interfere, and Raisha almost gets the pin on her at one point. Mickey retaliates by getting revenge and baseball sliding the second cousins twice removed in the face, and then the Bollywood boys chase them off. Mickey then nails the DDT and pins Raisha for the free. It was never in doubt really, was it? Next up there's a video package about the world title, but the announcers keep shouting over Matt Morgan's promo. I'm not sure why. He hasn't been a very good world champion really, has he? Jarrett is shown celebrating with his faction backstage. I thought he was annoyed with them. Steiner chases the cameraman off. It's your favourite part of the show next, as the obese Indian boy is out. Have you ever seen such a fat child? He will be teaming up with Romeo Raptor, the leather man, who isn't really that bad. But what contrasting characters these two are. They are facing, yes, Scott Steiner. Scott Steiner is going to destroy this Indian boy because he's fat. The boy knows he's in trouble. He looks terrified. He looks like he needs to go to the dump station ASAP. Steiner threatens to go into the crowd again, but he doesn't follow up on this threat. His partner will be the idiot Abyss. Whatever happens here, we are going to see something beautiful. The match starts and Abyss tries to throw the boy out the ring, but his belly gets stuck on the rope. Steiner is in the ring fighting Romeo and nails him with an overhead belly to belly. Steiner then suplexes him from the top. He's getting destroyed. Abyss and Steiner then swap who they are beating on. Come on Steiner, get him! 
Steiner puts the recliner on the boy, but he doesn't tap out. Abyss hits Romeo with the black hole slam while this is going on and pins him for the free. What a squash match. Steiner then storms into the crowd and climbs up to the upper levels. And the crowd are parting like an ocean. Abyss attacks a referee, and then Steiner slams the referee from the top. Seems a little bit harsh, what did he do wrong? Commissioner Jazzy Lahoria comes out next, and he brings the world's most random faction with him. Jeff Jarrett, who is of course the leader of the faction, says it's time to take Rinka King to the next level. Oh, I've heard that one before. Jarrett then says he's run successful wrestling organisations for 25 years, and he tells Jazzy that he needs to let Jarrett run Rinka King and tells him to sign it over. Oh, so it's another power struggle storyline then. I know we all love them. Jazzy refuses to do it anyway, so Steiner grabs him and he looks like he's going to pop his head off. Everyone is screaming at Jazzy to sign the contract. What happened to his bodyguard, the deadly dander? What's the point in him if he doesn't come out at this point? This literally goes on for five minutes with Jazzy Lahoria hesitating. He suddenly screws up the contract. Jarrett then says sign it or I'll smack you one and his faction have to hold him back. Jeff then offers to shake Jazzy's hand. He's caused Jazzy to be throttled, strangled and screamed at tonight. Jazzy shakes Jeff's hand like a complete idiot and then Jarrett turns around and smacks him one. This has literally been going on for 10 minutes now. Where's all the Indian talents? Jazzy then gets smashed with a steel chair and then he gets choked with the walking stick. People are chucking rubbish in the ring from the crowd now. For some reason the video then goes black and white. Not sure if this was just my end or not. Finally, someone comes out to make the save for Jazzy. It's the cricket guy. He does come out with a deadly dander though, but all they do is stare Jeff's faction down. Jeff, please hit the cricket guy, please, I'm begging you. It doesn't happen though, and then the episode ends. Best episode of Rinka King to date. As you can tell, due to the length of this video, there's a lot more happening on these shows now. On the next episode, we'll be watching Magnus challenge Morgan for the title, but I've gone on long enough here, so we'll save that for next week. And if you don't like it, then shove it. There was this one Indian ref. It was during um, the reveal of Abyss that uh, that this ref was supposed to get bumped, right? And Abyss bumps him, and then he gets right back up. And then, like, Scott Steiner bumps him, and he gets right back up. Like, everybody else is, like, laying down selling... But this ref is fucking Superman, you know what I mean? Like, you know, Abyss is like grabbing him and like choke slamming him. He gets right back up, you know what I mean? And we're like, what the fuck? And uh, I can't remember if it was still on the TV. I know they show him get bumped one time, but I don't know if they cut out all the rest of it. They definitely but cut it. Otherwise, I would have said something about it. <laughs> it was in. It was insane. And like he comes through the curtain. And Jeff Jarrett, like, grabs him and pulls his ref shirt off. He goes, what the fuck are you doing? And, like, just starts hitting him, you know what I mean? Like, it, like we were all like, what the fuck is going on? Like, this, yeah, this, so I know <laughs> that was probably cut out. But uh, it was insane. So Russo had nothing to do with any of it? Not that I'm aware of, no. <laughs> maybe it would uh maybe it will take some heat off of Vince to, you know to show that he you know it wasn't it wasn't always it, you, you it's not always blame Russo when you see all these random things happening that are like why is this happening why because I can see how to a lot of people from the outside looking in you might see the progression of some of the Rinka King stories and think this has got this has got Vince written all over it but as far as I'm aware unless he was unless he was consulting you know or unless Jeff was I know that's possible, I guess, that Jeff could have been like, hey, Vince, you know, like, but my guess is it was more a case of Jeff kind of instinctively following the same kind of pattern that Russo would do yeah. because Jeff and Russo were very tight. Jeff, uh, Jeff, Dutch Mantel, Abyss, uh, and Sanjay were sort of the, the nucleus of the sort of booking for Rinka King. And they, you know, between because the, even, you know, obviously Dutch is super old school and they came from that, you know, obviously Jeff and Dutch obviously come from that Tennessee style, right? Southern wrestling. But they, but they but still both been booking TNA for a long time. So they were all, so they all kind of had that instinctive thing of like, okay, open the show like we would open a TNA show, send out some cruiserweight guys, you know, X division guys, you know, bing, 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 you know, lots of high spots, bash, 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 you know, big cool finish, you know, send, you know, six, seven minutes, you know, get them fired up. Well, the thing is they did that on this, on the first India taping 
and you could tell that the audience just had no idea what they were looking at. So like they were doing, you know, it was like, I know that I remember Zima was in it, Zima Ion, who's now, uh, who's now in NXT. He's one of my good mates. And like, I forget who else was in that match, but they, you know, they're, they're doing all this great stuff, you know, cool high spots and head scissors and, you know, moon salts, blah, blah, blah. But like the audience is just kind of going like, eh, you know, like, eh, like you could tell they don't really. And I, I remember I wrestled Matt Morgan on the first tapings and we did it, you know, shoulder tackle, just a simple like boom. And, the pl and they erupted. They were just like, ah, you know, like, and, you know, it was like body slam, ah, you know, clothesline. Ah. So it was just, it, and then after that, you could, everyone started going, oh, this is awesome. You know, like, because everyone realized we could get so much more out of so much less and kind of stretch it out a bit. And What was the locker room like in, in India? Was there a big divide between you guys and the Indian wrestlers? Yeah, they, they, they changed in a whole nother uh, section of the uh, arena. Wow. Uh, Chris Masters kept calling this guy precious, but uh, there was a guy that uh, like would stand by our our dressing room and get us whatever we wanted. You know what I mean? Like if we wanted something, I used to have a picture of Chris Masters holding this guy. He's like a short Indian guy, and he just kept calling him precious. And the guy couldn't speak any English. Uh, but like he would, you know, if we ran out of waters or whatever, he would run and go grab them and stuff. When like Harbhajan Singh, the cricket player, he had his own section and stuff. Shove it squad, I'm here to give you the next three episodes of Rinka King. No shoving it around today. Make sure you subscribe, brothers! And shut up and smack that bell icon. Let's see how the power struggle storyline is going in Rinka King. On the last episode, Jeff Jarrett was revealed to be the boss of the world's most random faction and he wants to take over Rinka King. The show starts with Jarrett cutting a sincere promo that he just wants the best for Rinka King and he wishes Magnus good luck in his world title match against Matt Morgan. Everyone's favourite Joey Ryan is out next with Nunzio. They actually won a match last week, but don't get too far ahead of yourselves being impressed. It was against an obese eight-year-old child. The Bollywood boys and their banging theme music are tonight's opponents. Okay, maybe this girl doesn't quite think it's banging theme music. She can shove it though. The Bollywood boys win after hitting their double super kick. I still have no idea what either of their names are. I could look it up, but I'm watching these videos as a fan who isn't doing research. So tell me what their names are, damn it. Chavo Guerrero and Boredom Heart are backstage threatening Jeff Jarrett. Two fake Indian strongmen then walk up and ask them for a tag team title shot. What a barn burner that will be. Do you know what's weird? This match doesn't seem to air. So maybe it was terrible and they had to cut it from the show. Not sure if that would be Chavo's fault or the fake Indian looking strongmen. But either way, sorry to let you down here folks. The match isn't going to be airing. Taped earlier in the day, the Sheiks are shown walking around the Mumbai Travel Lodge looking for Mickey James. They find her room and beat her up. What is their problem with her? And why is this feud still continuing? It's completely pointless. The Leather Man is out next and he's taking on a fake cowboy who hasn't won a single match in all 12 episodes of Rinka King. He really takes this cowboy gimmick seriously. All he's missing is some cap guns like James Storm. This whole cowboy gimmick sucks. Nobody cares anymore. Do not bring those cap guns to the ring with you tonight. Cap guns? What are you talking about cap guns? Woo, it's going down in Tulsa tonight. Roscoe Jackson is the former Trevor Murdoch, and he's randomly a hill now. I guess they listened to my complaints last week. This guy just seems like such a natural hill. The leather man misses a splash, and then Roscoe Jackson hits a crossbody from the top rope to get the free. It went two minutes, and it was bad. A squash match that didn't even get the winner over. After the match, they shake hands and say what a great sportsman Roscoe Jackson is. Wait, so he's not a hill? Or maybe he is, who knows? And who cares? Morgan is backstage with the little interviewer man, saying he doesn't care who's running the company. Lots of hype packages on the show tonight for the world title match between Morgan and Magnus. If this show wasn't boring enough already, here comes the cricket guy to cut a promo. I assume it was about how much he wants to shake Jeff Jarrett's hand, but I don't know what he said here to be honest. And the world title match is up next, man, not much on this show tonight. They are trying to do the intros, but Jarrett is shown in the crowd with two tickets. 
The Indian security guy's head is so square, it looks like a garden shed. And for that matter, these two guys are bigger than 99% of the roster. Why aren't they fighting? For some reason, Jarrett then proceeds to move out the crowd and sit at the top of the ramp. So why did he need those two tickets? Or do those two tickets entitle him to sit at the top of the ramp? I don't remember seeing that on Ticketmaster.com. Anyway, Matt Morgan is completely distracted during the match by Jeff Jarrett, who is sat approximately 50 metres away. This allows Magnus to get the jump on him early on. Lots of boring brawling around the outside of the ring. Matt Morgan spends 90% of this match on the floor getting stamped on. Magnus hits his elbow drop from the top, but Morgan surprisingly kicks out of this. Magnus then puts a sleeper on. Talking of sleepers, this match is so dull I can barely stay awake. Morgan fights back with the usual predictable offence. He nails Magnus with the choke slam, And then suddenly a homeless intruder runs out from the crowd and tries to get in the ring. I never thought I'd be so happy to see this idiot. The Indian big boss man aka Deadly Dander then randomly turns heel and hits Morgan with his stick twice. And this allows Magnus to nail the Michinoku driver. And Magnus is now the second ever Rinka King world champion. So presumably we've got two new members of the world's most random faction. And they also have the belt now. Jarrett is in the ring celebrating, doesn't he have such a punchable face? For some reason the leather man and an obese Indian child then try to run out to the ring to attack the faction, but they're quickly thrown out. Lots of Indian jobbers keep running out, but they don't last two seconds against men twice the size of them. The cricket guy then walks out with a baseball bat. He's looking like Hawk Hogan from TNA in 2010. Everyone is terrified of him despite him basically being crippled. The eight men bail from the ring because they're so scared of him and his fake bat. I don't understand why this cricket guy is the biggest face on the show. You'd think they could have given this spot to another baby face that they wanted to get over, but instead they have to stupidly put this cricket guy over time and time again. So the show's over, and Matt Morgan's terrible world title reign is already over. He won one match against the Biker Undertaker ripoff. Let the Hawk know down below what you thought of Matt Morgan's world title reign. Did it live up to your expectations? Do you still think he should have held the TNA world title based on this? Shove it down below. What would you say being the second champion did for your career? Did, did it have any benefit for you ultimately? Uh, I mean, not not from a not from a not from a profile or like from a fan's perspective. Like it wasn't like they went, oh, now he's been Rinka King champion, you know. But certainly internally, like it was the first time where I had been put in a position where I had to carry someone. So I think that went a long way internally because guys like Abyss, uh, Scott, even, you know, Scott after that, I mean, really went to bat for me a lot, you know, and Jeff, they all went, dude, this guy, you know, he gets it. Like he made, he, he took this kid who's like, you know, literally had three, he, you know, third ever match and he made him look like a million bucks on TV and, you know, 12 million people watched it and he got this guy over, you know, a lot of that stuff that, that helped a lot of the, a lot of the Bruce Pritchards of the world and stuff who just thought I was just some like punk kid who wasn't in, wasn't even in the wrestling business. Cause I was in this pack with Crimson and Rob Terry and all these sort of guys who were, we all just floated around in this sort of explosion and like, Oh, they're sort of big green, you know, potential guys. And I was like, nothing against those guys, but I knew I was better than that. You know, I knew I was a different level and it was like, this was the way for them to be like, he's a different level, like go with him. And it was for a way for the boys to all go, yep, he's, he's earned it. You know what I mean? He, I worked harder to get better. On the next episode, the Bollywood boys are teaming up with Pagal Parinda. I'm told this guy's name roughly translates as crazy bird. Well, let me tell you, brother, this hawk's also crazy. They're taking on Zima Ion and Jimmy, don't let him near a mic rave. It's Jimmy Rave, and I'm ready to get this match over with so we can party! Woo! Their partner is a fake UFC fighter called Max B. So they've definitely lost this match because Max B hasn't won a single match on Rinka King and he's the biggest jobber on the show. Pagal Perinda and Zima Ion start the match, so the action is quite good. In fact, the whole match seems to be built around getting Pagal Perinda over, and he shows off a lot of good moves. Zima Ion then hits a big dive to the outside. The Bollywood boys then hit their double super kick on Jimmy Rave. This allows Pagal Perinda to hit the moonsault from the top and pin him for the free. A fun little cruiserweight match there. Next up, a lorry is shown driving around some roads in India and traveling on the back of it for some reason is the world's most random faction. Why are they just standing there like that? Couldn't they afford a limo? 
Jarrett says that they will have a coronation for Magnus and his world title win tonight. Mahabali Vera is lurking in the bushes and he questions why the deadly dander turned heel. Don't know, don't care. Chris Adonis is out next. This guy has been the definition of boring on these shows. He's taking on the obese eight-year-old Indian boy. Adonis strokes his fat belly and the commentary team almost die of laughter. I almost did too. Unfortunately, he doesn't like being made fun of and goes nuts at Adonis. It doesn't last long and Adonis hits the Samoan drop on the obese eight-year-old Indian boy. He then puts him in the Adonis lock and it's over. Good. Adonis then makes an open challenge that no one can break his master lock. This backfires on him though because it's answered by Mahabali Vera, who he's been trying to avoid this whole time. They continue to avoid Vera though, and nothing happens. Nunzio is out next, and he's accompanied by everyone's favourite, Joey Ryan. He's taken on Vera, who's already in the ring. Nunzio gets most of the match for some reason, but then Vera randomly hits a spinebuster for the free. What's the point in having squash matches where you're trying to get someone over, when the jobber gets most of the offence in? It doesn't make sense. Sanjay Dutt is backstage with a little interviewer man. He just hypes up the coronation of Magnus later on tonight. He's acting completely wacky as usual. The cricket guy is now interviewed for what seems like eternity. This is where I took my toilet break. Unfortunately, my computer screen's barely working after this. The coronation of Magnus is up next. There is some of the worst trumpet playing I've ever heard. I couldn't wait for this to be over. The world's most random faction officially now has a name, RDX. No idea what it stands for. Magnus has a throne and Jarrett puts a cheap looking crown on his head. What's interesting is Magnus would have another coronation in TNA in 2014 when he won his first world title with the Dixieland stable. Jarrett then announces that Scott Steiner and Abyss will be challenging for the tag team titles. Jarrett also says that he will continue paying the deadly dand of what he deserves. Jarrett then tells Sanjay Dutt that he's got a present for him as well because he's the greatest high flyer of all time. Oh, so maybe they're bringing in the Cruiserweight title for him and then he can compete on the... It's some golden wings. How about giving him something like a title to compete for? Golden wings? What on earth is this about? What a goofball. Why would he even put that on? Jarrett announces that his faction is officially called RDX. Sanjay Dutt then gives Jeff a present. It's a golden guitar. Jazzy Lahoria then comes out and threatens them, and he's joined by the rest of the Rinka King roster. The show then goes off the air. Good. The next show starts out with Angelina Love, who's making her debut in India. She doesn't shake her butt on the rope because she's in India. It would probably cause all sorts of outrage. The porn star gimmick wouldn't fly in India. Angelina Love gets on the mic and says she cannot wait to give her love to all the fans. Okay, so maybe she is doing the porn star gimmick. The Sheiks, who are taking on Max B and the Indian Leather Man, are in the ring next. So I'll give you two guesses who's going to win. But I'm actually wrong. The Sheiks randomly decide to cheat, and then Raisha Saeed tries to pull a weapon out of her boots, but Angelina Love runs back out to stop her from cheating, and the Leather Man uses the distraction to roll up her Rhea Davari for the free. Wow! Max B wins! The Leather Man then kisses Angelina Love's hand, and they seem to be quite taken with each other. The obese eight-year-old Indian boy is out next, and he's taking on one of the Mumbai cats called Leopard. Imaginative name there. I just can't get over this guy's facial expressions. I know I talk about him every show, but I just can't believe this guy was on a big stage like this. He looks like he absolutely stinks. He hits the weakest looking Northern Light suplex, and then he shakes his boobs at the crowd to celebrate. He then misses a drop kick, and the Mumbai cat jumps on top of him for the pin and beats him just like that. <laughs> Quite funny, really. What a loser. Talking of stinking, a homeless man suddenly appears in the ring for some reason. He takes out both of the Mumbai cats with a simple clothesline. He then grabs a chair and sits down, looking depressed. I felt like scraping through my wallet to find some rusty change to throw at him. I think he's complaining that he wants a title shot. Same stuff he does all the time. Completely undeserved, by the way. All he's done is beat up an eight-year-old Indian boy on this show. Jarrett then comes out with Magnus, Sanjay and the Indian Big Boss Man. They have t-shirts on that say RDX. Can someone please tell me what RDX even stands for? I tell you to leave some funny guesses in the comments section down below, but the X makes things a bit difficult, doesn't it? Well, what did RDX actually stand for? So apparently, if I remember this rightly, I, I could be wrong, but I think RDX is like a type of explosive that's sort of synonymous with like terrorists in India. Like, because, right. you know, they've, they've got their own, they've had their own issues over the years with, you know, Sikhs and Sikhs and Muslims and, you know, Hindus and Muslims and, you know, and, and stuff like that. 
and I, I feel like someone, someone told me that RDX was a sort of common, like C4, you know, that kind of, like it was a, it was a common kind of thing for explosives. So that's where it came. Cause I think if you look at the, when they, we had the t-shirts, but when they had the graphic, it was like, it looked like a pipe bomb yeah. sort of thing. So I, th I think it was, I think it was some sort of explosive. So you went for random dudes extreme. I mean, to be fair, it was very, it's, it's more accurate to the, to the English speaking audience as well, because it really was the most random group of people. <laughs> like why is, why, how is Jeff Jarrett in charge of one pompous British guy, one angry like American guy, one Indian guy and one monster who's kept in a cage. Like how did he get all these people together? <laughs> like, how did how did he recruit these people one by one? How did he convince them? How do they not all hate each other? Why are they why do they hate everyone else but they're okay with each other? Why does why does why does Steiner hate Indians but he doesn't hate Sanjay? <laughs> he says in one of the pros, oh. I hate Indian people. <laughs> Sanjay's standing right there, like, yeah, tell him, Scott. Jarrett then tells the homeless man that if he agrees to join forces with them, he might get a title shot at Magnus down the line. Why would they even want him in the faction? The homeless man gets in Jarrett's face. Can you imagine the smell of his breath? I bet it's like a thousand year old onions mixed with sewage. The homeless man storms off. I don't think he accepted Jeff Jarrett's offer. Jarrett then makes the announcement that Rinka King are bringing in a mediator to try and control their faction. Steiner and the Idiot Abyss are up next for their tag title shot. Some lanky nerd in the crowd throws something at Steiner, and then one of the security team punch him square in the head. Steiner and Abyss then charge at the crowd. I love this gimmick, it's great. They are taken on Boredom Hart and Eddie's nephew, who have been terrible tag team champions. They've done absolutely nothing since winning the titles. In fact, they've barely been on the show, which is a good thing, because Chavo's voice is like nails on a chalkboard. Chavo is isolated for a very, very, very long time with the Hills using every opportunity to cheat and keep Chavo in their own corner. Chavo is getting thrown around like a ragdoll by Steiner, but he keeps kicking out of his moves. He eventually tags out to Boredom Hart, who super kicks Steiner, and then him and Chavo start double teaming. Hart hits a power slam on Steiner, and then Abyss tries to hit the black hole slam on Chavo, but he reverses it. Chavo then nails the frog splash, but Sanjay Dutt runs out with his goofy wings, and the referee is distracted. Well, why wouldn't he be? Look at the state of him. Abyss then nails the black hole slam and pins Chavo for the free. We have new tag team champions, ladies and gentlemen, and RDX have all the gold in Rinka King. I can't get over how stupid those wings are on Sanjay. What does he think he is in some goofy fairy tale or something? A cheap looking 4x4 is shown outside the arena, but it's abandoned. Jazzy Lahoria then comes out with Matt Morgan and Maha Bali Vera. Why doesn't he just bring the cricket guy with him as backup instead of these two idiots? It's already been proved that everybody is scared of the cricket guy. Oh, he comes out next. RDX look really annoyed, possibly even scared. So does that mean that the cricket guy is the mediator who's going to control their faction? They announced that on the next show, Matt Morgan will get his rematch against Magnus. So that's your feel for now, folks. I'm not sure how I feel about these three episodes. They weren't good. It felt like they were in full TNA mode here. So many pointless squash matches, and it was all about RDX, but they failed to explain what RDX even stands for, so it's a complete failure in my eyes. At least the belts have all switched to better wrestlers now, but it's already starting to feel like the Jeff Jarrett show. Dumbest moment of the week has to be Sanjay Dutt and his golden wings. What a little pansy. I just can't relate to wearing golden wings, and I'm not even sure most people can. Is this an Indian thing? Let me know down below. I'm sorry if it is, I just don't get it. And if you like Sanjay Dutt and his golden wings, shut up or I'll smack you one. In Rinka King, they didn't have a cruiserweight belt. Instead, <laughs> instead they had those golden wings. What was, right. what was the thought process behind that? <laughs> you, I mean, you have to ask uh, Dutch Mantel that. I don't know. Like, uh, it was supposed to be a title. You know what I mean? And like, and like they they were grooming Pagal to do that. You know what I'm saying? And like his gimmick was a bird gimmick, so. It makes sense for him, so. But uh, but yeah, like, I don't know. I think, I think the idea behind it, it was something like they wanted something super visual for it, you know. Um, you know, but I, dude, I've I've won weirder things. I want to. I wrestled for Vince Russo and won a sword once. 
<laughs> I was going to talk about that later, but thank you for bringing that up, Jimmy. No um, a lot of fans wanted to know your thoughts on that and also what happened to the sword, if you know that. <laughs> I know, I don't know that. Uh, you know, looking back on it, it was like a real health health issue. Like, they got a sword, like, pointing down at us <laughs> as we're wrestling. You know, like, luckily that thing didn't fall, but... Uh, Jeff, pretty much from the beginning, I remember Jeff sort of laying out to me, like, we're going to use this as a way for you to really be showcased in a top spot, you know, like, and it's because it, he said that you're going to, um, he said, this is going to be a way for us to, to show them meaning like Bruce and Eric and, you know, the, the sort of powers that be at the time, you know, that you can, that you can, that, you know, that this is what they need to be thinking of you as for the future. I said, great, cool. Sounds good. And, you know, I mean, but I, that was as much as I heard. Basically, like, you're going to be booked, you know, you're going to be in a good spot sort of thing. It's going to be, and I, you know, I didn't care. I was just wanting to go and work, you know, to do whatever. And, did they um, give you an option or did you have to go? No, it was, yeah, no, it was, it was, I was pretty much told I was going. Um, but it was, it was more like, this is, you know, this is what, like, this is, this is why it's going to be really good for you. And, you know, you're going to be in this, you're going to be sort of showcased in a good spot and, you know, used effectively and it's going to be great. And, you know, Jeff's, Jeff's a big, Jeff's a huge salesman, you know? So he, 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 uh, he's like, buddy, it's going to be good for you. You know, you're going to, this is good. Like you're going to get, this is, this is going to, this is going to get, this is going to get you where you need to be. You know, like, okay, great. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Love It Squad, it comes around once a month and it's not that thing that causes you and your girl to almost kill each other. No, no, it's quite the opposite in fact and it spreads joy and happiness and it makes your girl sing. It's Rinka King. On the last video, Steiner and Abyss won the tag titles and their Jeff Jarrett faction was given the name RDX. I asked you, the Hawkamaniacs, what you think RDX should stand for, and it was never explained on the Rinker King show. Well, congratulations to Mike Bottomless Pip Dunham, who wins with my favourite comment suggestion. From now on, until the end of time, this faction will be known as Random Dudes Extreme. You, young man, are a very lucky little guy. You win a hawk feather, a punch to the gut, and an all-expenses-paid-for trip to Barrow in Finesse. Shut the front door! I think this name fits them the best because I was already calling them the world's most random faction. I know a lot of you wanted Rubbish Degeneration X to win the poll, and you can all moan and complain in the comments section, but shut up or I'll smack you all. To quote Marvin Gaye, let's get it on. Well, here's a surprise. This show starts out with Shearer. No, no, not that Shearer. This one's been on Rinker King for 14 episodes and has done absolutely nothing but carry a briefcase for Chris Adonis. I'm not even exaggerating, unfortunately. But apparently he's having his first match here and he's taking on Maha Bali Vera. <laughs> so it's Vera versus Shearer. We find out pretty quickly why Shearer hasn't had any matches on this show, because he's not very good. Maha Bali Vera puts him away in about 30 seconds with the Vera bomb. He then challenges Chris Adonis to a fight who runs away like a little girl. Backstage the authority figures are talking to a lawyer when random dudes extreme interrupt the meeting. Jarrett says that they have all the gold and all the power. The cricket guy then says something and Jarrett seems a bit upset. Backstage, two eight-year-old Indian boys are sitting on the bench. One is obese and one is little. There's super dramatic music playing and his voice is so high. He says he's the number one wrestler on Ring for King. I can't cope, I love this show. <laughs> Nick Dinsmore is out for a match next and he's teaming up with TNT who is an obese version of Savio Vega. What a team these two make. Have you ever seen two less fitting people hanging around together? They are taking on two fake Indian looking strongmen for Family Guy. You have to hear this entrance music. Just listen to it. <laughs> I think the commentary team say that they're lorry drivers, I might be wrong. Nick Dinsmore starts the match out by popping some pills because everyone involved with TNA is on drugs. Savio and Dinsmore keep cheating. This isn't very good, unfortunately. The two fake Indian strongmen only know how to do a clothesline. I'm guessing these guys aren't in NXT or AEW at the moment. They do a double tag team move on Savio Vega. I have no idea what it was. It was a battering ram maneuver or something. It's over. Bad match. The legal meeting carries on backstage. Jeff Jarrett tells a joke and they all burst out laughing and it ends. 
I have no idea what's going on on this show. The fake badass Undertaker comes out next and he's taking on Roscoe Jackson. <sighs> Give me a break. We've seen this match about five times. Can't he go and beat up the Indian Big Boss Man or somebody different? The Undertaker 2.0 dominates the match and hits a rock bottom. He then carries on his dominance with a butterfly suplex. Cowboy Trevor Murdoch tries to fight back but he can't do much because he's a jobber. The Undertaker then does a leg drop and a couple of corner shots. He then misses a splash in the corner and the Cowboy finally takes him off his feet with a suplex. Jackson then hits a crossbody from the top but can't put The Undertaker away. This is a really good match to be fair. They start brawling on the outside and then Taker hits a big boot. He then tries to bring a plate into the ring and the Cowboy rolls him up for the free. Wasn't expecting that. After the match Taker hits him with it and carries on the beatdown. Someone in the comments asked for the Cowboy to get a push. Maybe this is the start of one. Back in the legal meeting Jeff Jarrett says once again they have all the power because they have all the belts. I swear this was a storyline in TNA at some point, god knows when. Somewhere else backstage, the little interview man asks Matt Morgan who he thinks will be in control of Rinka King at the end of the night. Morgan says he doesn't know, but he does know that he's getting a rematch for his world title against Magnus. The cricket guy is up next, his theme music is like death, it's just his name over and over again. He brings out Jeff Jarrett and his lawyer. The cricket guy is basically the mediator even though he's not neutral because he tried to beat people up with a cricket wicket last week. You'd think they could give him a bat instead. He brings out Jazzy Lahoria and his lawyer next. It's a power struggle story and I'm once again, but I don't see how Jarrett has any right to own in the company just because some of his wrestlers have the belts. It sounds like they're going to have a match to decide who will take over Rinka King. It's winner takes all. Winner, winner takes all. They point to the Titan Tron and a lorry is shown driving a fully erected cage around. Why is the cage already set up on the lorry? Jeff Jarrett doesn't seem too happy about the match and then DDT's his lawyer. That's one episode down. Random dudes extreme come out to start the next show. The lawyer is still apparently employed by them but he's in a neck brace now. All the other guys in this group seem irrelevant. The camera is on Jarrett 90% of the time. Jeff says that they're going to be adding a fifth member of RDX tonight. I thought the Indian Big Boss Man was a member. They hype up the multi-man cage match that will be happening. Jarrett then says it's time to introduce the fifth member. And it's... It's the Indian Big Boss Man. Why was this announced like it was a surprise? He's been with them for about five shows now. Apparently he's going to have his first match on Rinka King. And he'll be taking on Puma who is one of the Mumbai Cats. He wins pretty quickly with the boss man slam. There's not much to say. For those of you who may have forgotten at this point, Magnus is still the world champion. Not that we'd know it. Alyssa flashes out next to take on Angelina Love who's not allowed to shake her ass on the ropes. Despite that, she's still incredibly popular with the Indian fans. Angelina Love wins with the lights out and the ring announcer says your winner of the match is the very lovable Angelina Love. <laughs> The leather man then comes out to give her a rose. She seems quite taken with him. The midget then comes out dragging a bear that's much bigger than he is. Unfortunately, this bear isn't from the leather man and it seems to be from the midget. The midget then kisses her hand and starts dancing. Angelina Love looks very confused. Which man will she pick? Then she leaves. Jazzy Lahoria is naming his team for the cage match. It sounds like it'll be Matt Morgan, Maha Balivera, Bulldog Hart and Chavo, but I think there's a member missing. The heavyweight title is on the line next. Matt Morgan, who's been nothing short of snore inducing, is out first. Magnus is the champion, but he's had hardly any TV time. I'm pretty sure we saw him at the start more often than this. Let's see if they can have an interesting match. The last one wasn't very good. They fight in the crowd again, but only for a second. Unfortunately, it seems pretty quickly that this is the same match as last time. Morgan hurts his leg as he does a leg drop on the ring apron. Magnus then works his leg for what seems like forever. Morgan surprisingly kicks out of the top rope elbow drop. It looks like this might not be the night for Magnus. Morgan then hits the choke slam and goes for the carbon footprint, but random dudes extreme run out for the DQ. Bulldog Hart and Chavo try to make the save, but they get beaten down. Maha Bali Vera then runs out and takes out all four men by himself. He's doing quite well, but then the Indian big boss man runs out and hits him with his nightstick. A homeless man then enters the ring and steals the nightstick and beats up all the guys in Random Dudes Extreme. What an anti-hero this man is. Jazzy Lahoria then gets on the mic to hype the cage match. Then the show ends. I almost fell asleep. Episode 3 starts out with a cruiserweight match. It's Jimmy, don't let him near a mic rave. It's Jimmy Rave and I'm ready to get this match over with so we can party! Woo! So uh, you've become a bit of a favourite on my channel due to that uh, that party promo that you did. Um, oh yeah, yeah. What, what are your memories of that? Uh, you know, so we we that was actually a, asked of me to do, like because we were doing the um, we were doing the Rinky King thing, and so uh, so like. Z they wanted to tag Zima, Ion, and I, uh, and like have us just do like a party gimmick. 
um, because like everything there was super uh, gimmicky. Ooh. And he's taking on the fake Hawk Hogan, who is actually pretty good. And he's also facing Zima Ion. Jimmy Rave cripples the Birdman on the ring apron. And then Zima Ion flies over the top rope onto both men. Zima Ion then hits a drop kick, and then the Birdman jumps off the top rope with a Hurricanrana. Zima throws the Hawk off the top rope and then hits a 450 on Jimmy Rave for the win. I asked this in the last video, but no one seems to know the answer, so I'll ask again. Where is this fake Hawk nowadays? I actually thought he was decent and had a bit of a future. Sanjay Dutt then comes out wearing his stupid golden wings. I have no idea why he's wearing them, he looks so stupid. Jazzy Lahorio is backstage talking tactics, but the homeless man is there and he seems like he's on their team now. He stays away from the others because he smells. Does Jazzy realise that two of the men in the ring that he's ranting at don't even speak Hindi? Oh for God's sake, it's the Adonis Lock Challenge now. I thought this was over. It's not happened for ages. They bring in a scruffy looking guy from the audience, but he doesn't last five seconds. This is the most drawn out thing I've ever seen. We all know that eventually Maha Balivira is going to break the lock. Adonis then puts one of the cameramen in the Adonis lock. Adonis then says that he accepts Mahabalivira's challenge to a match. Backstage, random dudes extreme are talking about some arm wrestling tournament that's going to happen. Steiner says that he's 92-0 in arm wrestling. I don't reckon he's lying about this. Apparently, if any of these guys lose, Jeff Jarrett will have to arm wrestle Jazzy Lahoria. How is that a punishment? He's almost crippled. It's an eight-man tag team match next. The Sheiks come out and they are the team of Sheik Abdul Bashir and his son Aria Davari. They will be teaming with Dr. Nick Dinsmore and Safati Vega because they made such a great team last time. They will be taking on the Bollywood boys and their banging theme music. And the team of the eight year old obese Indian boy and the Lever Man. The Lever Man comes out of Angelian Love, so I guess you chose him over the midget. It's not a very good match, but my favourite part of this was the eight-year-old obese Indian boy getting the hot tag and running wild on everyone, and then he was clotheslining people and then falling over. He then tries to hit a crossbody, but just kind of slops into both men. The boy has the match won, but Raisha Saeed distracts the referee. The Sheiks then steal the pin, so the boy loses again, and he looks like he's dumping in his nappy. I'm pretty sure he's the only man on this show who's not won a single match. Raisha Saeed and Angelina Love then brawl in the ring. Random Dudes Extreme are out next for their arm wrestling tournament. They bring out Bulldog Hart and Maha Bali Vera who will be competing against them. Scott Steiner is up first against Bulldog Hart. Man, this is going to be great. Steiner wins. It was never in doubt really, was it? Although a bit anticlimactic, nothing really happened. Magnus is up next to take on Vera. Magnus stalls for ages. This is probably the only sort of match that Vera has a chance of winning at. And I'm right. Vera actually beats Magnus here. This means that Jazzy Lahorio and Jeff Jarrett will now need to arm wrestle in the final round. Jarrett is also stalling forever and doesn't seem like he wants to wrestle Jazzy Lahoria. Once they get down to brass tacks, Jarrett's about to lose. So then Steiner gets on the ring apron and distracts the referee. Sanjay Dutt then tips water into Jeff's mouth, who then spits it into Jazzy's face. <laughs> Jarrett wins the arm wrestling match. Why didn't Sanjay just throw the water at Jazzy's face himself? <laughs> So random dudes extreme win, and they'll now have the man advantage in the lethal lockdown cage match. They all fight afterwards because they don't like each other very much, and then the show ends. Last episode we're going to be looking at today, and it starts out with everybody's favourite, Joey Ryan and Nuncio. They're taking on, yes, the fake Indian strongmen from Family Guy. This music gets me every time, it's just a load of car horns beeping. These two are just weird. I have no earthly idea what they're meant to be doing. They do their battering ram thing and take out Nuncio and Joey Ryan. They then hit a double suplex on Jerry Ryan and they pin him. When was the last time anyone was pinned with such a basic move like a double suplex? I guess it's old school, we've become too accustomed to watching a million flashy moves to end a match. Not in Rinka King my friends. Random dudes extreme are backstage getting a pep talk from Jarrett ahead of their cage match. Sanjay Dutt starts trying to hype them up like it's Vince McMahon before Survivor Series 2001. The other team also gets a pep talk from Jazzy Lahoria, but they all seem like they still want to keep away from the homeless man because he stinks like a thousand year old onions mixed with sewerage. They then cut to the ring and there's hundreds of people trying to put the cage together. It was fully assembled on the lorry, so it begs the question, why did they assemble it in the first place? Random dudes will have the man advantage in this match because they won at arm wrestling on the last episode. This is going to be a lethal lockdown match, apart from it won't have weapons, so it's not as good. Sanjay Dutt will start out the match minus his golden wings. By the way, I posted this on my Insta on Sunday, but I actually found some golden wings for sale for £600 in Cadbury's. So if anyone wants to be just like your hero Sanjay Dutt, go get them. 
Eddie's nephew will be starting the match for the good guys. Imagine if he turned heel or did something interesting. Sanjay Dutt tries to jump him from the top, but Chavo flattens him with a drop kick. He then does the three amigos because he's Eddie's nephew, so of course he does. This is when I realised that it's such a long time between the next wrestler coming out. I think it's been about five minute intervals. The next wrestler is Scott Steiner, and he takes out Chavo with ease. Bulldog Hart then comes out. I swear that interval was about one minute. It's inconsistent. Bulldog Hart kicks them both and then Magnus comes out. That felt like even less time. What's the big deal of having a man advantage if you only have the advantage for about 30 seconds? Matt Boring is out next and he throws Sanjay Dutt face first into the cage. The Indian Big Boss Man is out next and he gets beaten up straight away. Mahabali Vera is out next and he takes out all the bad guys himself. The crowd are loving this guy and they're chanting his name. Chavo then climbs up to the top of the cage and dives onto everyone for the high spot of the match. The Idiot Abyss is out next and he throws Matt Morgan into the cage door, which then bursts open. That only leaves one man left. They've truly saved the best until last, as the homeless man comes out. On his way to the ring, Jarrett starts talking to him, and then he offers him a load of money to change sides. You could buy a week in a hostel with that sort of money, lad. I would do it if I were you. Why does Jarrett even want him anyway? What's he done to prove himself? They then padlock the cage doors shut. Have you ever seen such a big padlock? Where did they even get that from? It looks ridiculous. You know, I was just thinking, why is every TNA Power Struggle storyline settled in a lethal lockdown match? Everybody starts hitting their finishers. Jarrett has knocked down Jazzy Lahoria on the outside and attacks him with his walking stick. Jarrett then tries to throw something into the cage, but he misses. It's a bunch of handcuffs and they handcuff all the good guys to the cage. Jarrett then throws the walking stick into the cage and then they hit the homeless man with it. The big boss man then starts dishing out some hard time and then he pins the homeless man for the free. So I was completely right then, this guy is worthless. Maybe if he'd got in the cage match and actually done something, it might have helped elevate this guy. But he's just gone into the match and been beaten down and been the one that got pinned. Why couldn't it be Chavo or someone else? So Jarrett now owns Rinka King or something like that. This has really turned into the Jeff Jarrett show since he's turned up. I'm surprised he's not been wrestling in matches yet. So that's four episodes this time. We saw a few guys wrestle who haven't had matches before. I don't think anyone particularly embarrassed themselves except for one little boy. They make sure that all the Indian guys don't attempt to do anything that they could mess up. They just do clotheslines and kicks. You all thought Mahabali Shira was limited in green when he turned up in TNA. Well, believe me, he's the best of a bad bunch. Imagine if TNA had tried to push the Indian big boss man or the homeless man. Trust me, we got off light with Shira. Not the language barrier, just, you know, just their attitudes, really. You know what I mean? Like, that was, that was the, the biggest thing. You know, they were told to be there early, you know, get in the ring and, and, and stuff. And then um, me and, like, me and Nunzio were there. We're waiting. It's like 30 minutes past the time they're supposed to be there. And uh, so I sit, I sit brood back there to, to check on them. And they were all like, oh, we're, we're too hurt to go out. You know, we've been wrestling two days in a row. Like, we don't want to wrestle. And then, like, all hell broke loose. Like, uh, like I, I pulled them out there. You know, I was telling them, like, look, man, this is your fucking job. You know, we're you're on the biggest station in India. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so, you know, like, and you've only been training for third, you know, sixty days. So, like, you need to come out here. And then, like, they, you know, like, try to like talk back to me. And then um, Sanjay and the lady that was the executive director for Endermall. Endermall was the big production company. They came out and yelled at them, and uh, but like, yeah, it got real. It got real heated, and like, you know, Nunzio was like, you know, I like I work for WWE where I'm on the road 200 days a year. You know, you guys have only wrestled two days. You know what I'm saying? Like, the fuck are you talking about? You know? And so, uh, it, yeah, they were like being like prima donnas because uh, like India still has that caste system. You know what I'm saying? Like, so. Uh, so some of them felt like they didn't have to, you know, go and do that. Despite the fact that most of these guys, these Indian guys were complete rookies, right? Complete jabronis, never done anything, you know, and didn't know a headlock from a headlight. A lot of them had real attitudes on them. Like they were like super prima donnas, you know, because they didn't understand the wrestling business. They don't understand the sort of, 
the, the whole sort of respect protocols and the sort of um, just the just the general sort of hierarchy that exists in the, in the wrestling dressing rooms. They just they're just like oh I guess we're TV stars now and in India you know with the caste system and everything there is already a much more sort of acceptable approach of like I'm important and you're not and you know I'll never forget we sh- we all walked in and like there's all these wrestlers who no you know no, no one's ever heard of but no and they were standing there literally like this in the dressing room while like two guys were like oiling them. You know what I mean? And like putting their boots on for them and stuff. And they're just standing there like, you know, king shit. Like, and we were just like, oh God, what a bunch of assholes, you know? I mean, Vera was a sweetheart. Like I will say that Mahabali Vera, he was, he was a sweetheart. Like he was a very nice guy, but you know, just, just, I mean, two left feet, you know, like he got better. And I mean, look, he even had, he had, I mean, even WWE even picked him up for a little while, but they, but deadly Danda, is now in, uh, and I didn't even know that. I I learned that from looking at the comments in your videos. Because someone, crazy. or actually, I think it might have been, I might have posted a picture. Because remember, Deadly Dander joined our group for some, for some bizarre reason. Like, I completely forgot about that. I was like, oh, yeah, because we called him Indian Boss Man. Yeah. So we we're like, oh, yeah, Indian Boss Man was in our group for a while as well. I forgot about that. Like, we gave him money. Was, Jeff gave him money. <laughs> it's so stupid. Love it, squad. Just a quick disclaimer. If your girl's in the room, send her out, because I'm about to make her sing. It's time for Ring King. We probably only have two to three more videos left on this series. I know, it's sad, isn't it? There's tears running down this hawk's beak, because Ring King genuinely brings me joy and happiness. The show starts out with a stupid random dude's extreme lawyer and a neck brace. He announces that Jeff Jarrett is the supreme power in Ring King, and he's now running the show. The first match of the show is an interesting one. It's a Mumbai street fight between the Underfaker and the Cowboy. They start out brawling on the back of a red truck, which seems to be all over the show for some reason. They hit each other with kendo sticks. I thought this whole match was going to be on the back of the truck. I'm disappointed now. The Underfaker climbs inside the truck cab, so the Cowboy smashes his face into the steering wheel. They then brawl back to the arena. The Underfaker keeps throwing chairs at the Cowboy, but I guess Indian steel chairs aren't as devastating. They make it to the ring and the Cowboy is bleeding. This is by far the most violent match we've seen across these episodes. I'm not sure that the Indian fans will be able to take this. The Underfaker crashes into the referee, but I'm not sure if it was deliberate. The cowboy then puts a pot on the underfaker's head and plays the spoons on it. Both men are now bleeding at this point. The cowboy then destroys a fake concession stand. The cowboy sets the underfaker up on the stand and dives into him with an elbow drop. It doesn't break though, unfortunately, probably because it's a car and not a table. The cowboy hits an elbow drop on a trash can. They then enter the ring for the first time in the match. The underfaker throws powder in the cowboy's eyes. He then hits the worst throw for a table that I've ever seen. He barely touched him, but he flew through the air like a hawk. It's over. Backstage, Chavo is telling the eight-year-old Indian boy what a good job he's doing. I can't even say that with a straight face. He tells him it's not about how often he gets knocked down, but how often he gets back up again. Chavo tells him he'll get his first win soon. Yeah, right, and I'll get a written apology from Garrett Bischoff for wasting so much of my time as a teenager. The lawyer tells Chavo and Boredom Hart that they have the night off because nobody wants to see them and sends them home. I love it when a TV programme is self-aware. He doesn't send the boy home though because this show wouldn't be the same without him. The American Adonis comes out next with Vera. He says it's time for the Adonis Lock Challenge and everybody boos. I don't often agree with wrestling fans. He does the gimmick that he's going to pick a random scrub out of the audience but instead Mahabali Vera comes out and challenges him. Never thought I'd be so happy to see this guy. Vera challenges him to the Adonis Lock Challenge right now and the crowd go nuts. They love this guy. The challenge is on and Vera fights for ages but eventually goes down to his knees. He then fights back up and breaks the Adonis Lock. Adonis is devastated about this loss and Vera wins enough Indian rupees to fly to America and follow his dreams to one day fight the idiot abyss in TNA. Adonis is a bad loser so he attacks Vera afterwards. Matt Boring is backstage with a little Indian man. He asks him what he thinks about Jeff Jarrett. The Indian big boss man and the lawyer then walk up and tell him that Jeff Jarrett has ordered him to leave the building. Matt Boring refuses to leave unless the big boss man agrees to fight him in a match. Oh, I'm sure that'll be a real barn burner. The Sheiks are out next for a mixed tag match. It's Raisha Saeed and Aria Davari, who is Sheikh Abdul Bashir's half-sister. They'll be taking on the Indian Leather Man and Angelina Love, who are in the middle of a weird love triangle storyline with a midget. Maybe I'll cover it one day. 
The midget comes out during the match again to cheer on Angelina Love. She hits the Botox injection. Sheikh Abdul-Bashir tries to interfere, but the midget knocks him over. Raisha Saeed uses the distraction to hit her finisher and win the match. The midget and the leather man then start pushing each other. Dr. Nick Dinsmore comes out to attend to Angelina Love because she's knocked out. The Indian big boss man then comes out and tells him not to worry about saving Angelina and just tells her to push her out of the ring like a piece of trash. He's with the lawyer again. Since when did they become the best of friends? Random dudes extreme come out to join them. Suddenly out of nowhere, the obese eight-year-old Indian boy is at ringside. He looks like he's going to cry. Jeff Jarrett says that he's the new boss and he's going to make some changes. He makes the match of Magnus versus a random opponent. Magnus tries to remind us that he's the champion, but we all forget. He also says Abyss and Scott Steiner will be taking on the fake Indian strongmen from Family Guy. Finally, he says he will be having a match on the next show and he will be fighting the cricket guy. For some reason, some men come out carrying a photo of the cricket guy, in case we'd all forgotten what that idiot looks like. Jarrett starts talking to it. Jarrett says he's willing to put a blindfold on to face him. Here's a better idea. Make him wrestle with his hand behind his back so he can't shake yours. Jarrett then turns his attention to the men on the outside of the ring and tells the three useless men to get into the ring. It's the leather man, the midget, and the eight-year-old obese Indian boy. DJ, yeah. get these three useless individuals up in the ring. Jarrett threatens to fire them. He then says he's going to give them all new jobs, but not as wrestlers. He brings up the fact that the boy hasn't won a single match since coming to Rinka King. <laughs> in case we needed reminding what a jobber he is. He says that he's only capable of cleaning the locker rooms. The boy runs off crying and looks like he's dumping in his nappy as Jarrett kicks him in the ass. Next up, Jarrett starts insulting the leather man and tells him that his new job will be cleaning the toilets. Jarrett then cuddles the midget and calls him useless. Jarrett says that the midget needs to kiss his feet or he will fire him. Jarrett then starts spreading his filthy mouldy cheese feet as the midget screams and says that he won't do it. Random dudes extreme have to restrain the midget and then they force Jarrett's feet into the midget's mouth. What am I reading here? The midget bites Jeff Jarrett's toe. Scott Steiner then attacks the midget and then all the random guys start doing moves to him. Suddenly some music hits. It's Samosa Joe. He comes out and everybody looks terrified. He stands with his arms on where his hips are supposed to be and then the show ends. I have no idea who this guy is and why everyone looks so scared. Wow, that's just one show down. A lot going on here. Episode 2 starts with Sanjay and Magnus coming out to the ring, but Sanjay doesn't have his golden wings. Oh wait, there they are, they're hanging up above him. What the hell are they doing up there? Sanjay has a blue bag with him. Magnus pulls a piece of paper from the bag. I think they're doing a random draw for his opponent for tonight. Magnus doesn't seem to be very happy with his pick. For some reason the midget comes out next and it's revealed that he'll be having a ladder match with Sanjay Dutt. And I guess the winner gets the wings? Why would the midget want them? During the match, it cuts backstage to show a fake hawk, Zima Ion, and Jimmy don't let him near a mic rave. It's Jimmy Rave, and I'm ready to get this match over with so we can party! Woo! They're complaining that the midget has been given a shot at the wings. So are the wings basically the cruiserweight belt? If so, this is the strangest looking belt of all time. The midget takes out Sanjay Dutt and climbs the ladder. Sanjay then tries to powerbomb him, but the midget does a hurricanrana instead. Sanjay is literally getting his ass handed to him by this guy. The midget and Sanjay are then at the top of the ladder fighting, and then the midget pushes Sanjay Dutt off the top. Don't get too excited though, folks. Sanjay quickly scrambles back up and pushes the midget off the top to retain his stupid golden wings. Sanjay then puts the wings on and celebrates on top of the ladder, but he's interrupted by... Oh my god, it's Samosa Joe again! He sits on a couch on the ramp, because when you're as fat as he is, it's tiring standing up all the time. Special offer guys, entrance away couch seats now available on tripadvisor.com, perfect for the fat boys out there. Steiner and Abyss are out next and they threaten the crowd a bit. Their opponents are the Mumbai Cats. I thought it was going to be the fake Indian strongmen from Family Guy. For those of you who don't know the Mumbai Cats, they're basically the Young Bucks before they became the Hardy Boys. Did you know that I was one of the cats too? What? No. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was the Young Bucks. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I was one oh, of I the cats. I didn't know that, Jimmy. That's, yeah. that's, that's breaking news. No one knew that. Yep, yep. Which one were you, Puma or uh, I don't know what the other one was called? I don't know. Steiner screams at Abyss to kill them. The Mumbai Cats try desperately to take Abyss off his feet, but they fail, and Abyss kicks one of them in the face. Steiner then busts out the Frankensteiner for the first time in Rinka King. I wonder when the last time he did that move was, and why did he use it in this match of all matches? They then go to leave, but they are blocked by some scrubs who say that they can't leave because it's a 2 out of 3 falls match. 
Why? How did that stipulation come to be and what was the point? Abyss rolls back into the ring and then hits a black hole slam on one of the Mumbai cats for the free. Chavo is backstage with Boredom Heart and Matt Boring. Chavo talks about how he's from a historic wrestling family. Yeah, we've heard that one before. Just like he always does. Matt Morgan says they are rooting for the cricket guy to beat up Jeff Jarrett tonight. Jarrett is backstage warming up for his blindfold match. He punches the lawyer in the face who complains that Jarrett has broken his nose. The little interviewer man is somewhere else backstage with Maha Bali Vera. He asks him what he spent his money on and Vera says strippers, whores and lingerie for Dixie Carter. Jarrett comes out being guided by his lawyer as he's blindfolded. Here's an idea you idiot. Put the blindfold on once you get to the ring. What the hell is wrong with this idiot? Jarrett gets the mic and says that he's trained all his life to take on this cricket guy. A ring kicking lawyer comes out and says that the match will not take place. What a coward. I wanted Jarrett to give him the stroke. Jarrett then says he'll fight anyone in the building. This challenge is answered by Jazzy Lahoria for some reason. He looks a bit weird not wearing his traditional robes. Samosa Joe is still shown sitting on his couch without an explanation. Jazzy is here to take up the challenge to fight Jeff Jarrett. Jazzy slams Jarrett and then his lawyer gets on the ring apron and Jarrett hits a low blow. Jarrett then hits the stroke and it's over. What was the point? Jarrett then continues to attack Jazzy after the bell. He smashes his guitar over Jazzy's head, but it didn't draw a single rupee. Sanjay and Magnus are celebrating backstage and then they go off to join Jarrett. The camera pans to a sofa to show a small Mexican man is seen hiding. It's revealed to be Team Boring who emerge and take the bag with the pieces of paper. Magnus is out to defend his title next from the random draw, but brings Sanjay with him and the big boss man. His opponent is... <laughs> the obese eight-year-old Indian boy. I thought they sent him away to clean the building. He gets interviewed on the ramp. I just can't take this guy seriously. I can't believe this guy has a title shot. Sanjay Dutt does the ring introductions. Someone please, I'm begging you, tell me what he says here about the boy. I'm hoping it's Scott Steiner ring announcing levels of hilarity. Yeah, Joe Russell here. Yeah, Mr. Pune, right you here. Mr. India, right you here. Hey, or yeah, wrestler. India ka best hai. Wrestling ki dunya mein ye India ki shaan hai. Iski jab satakti hai to aache aache wrestler ki wakt lag jati hai. Puri dunya ki wrestlers iski taakat ko salam karte hai. To to te to tayar ho. Ye to kamaal ho gaya jo jis baru ko Jeff Jarrett ne bezat karke Magnus seems to be in complete shock that this is the match. Magnus gets on his knees and he's only slightly smaller than the Indian boy. Magnus wins in literally 20 seconds with a bad looking Michinoku driver. What a main event that was. The roster then come out to surround the ring. Vera gets the mic to reveal that every single name in the bag says the eight year old obese Indian boy. This means that they literally valued him as the biggest joke on the roster that couldn't possibly win. The random draw was a fix. They all start fighting as they don't like each other very much. For some reason, Abyss, Steiner and Jarrett are nowhere to be seen. The show's over. That was a bad one. So the Hawkster never came up to you and said, Magnus, brother, I, I saw your 10 second victory over the boy. <laughs> oh, let me tell you about that. Uh, no, no, Hulk did not. Hulk probably didn't even know my name but uh, at that point. But <laughs> Barood, okay, let me tell you something. Uh, as much as I enjoyed the videos, your your treatment of Barood is unacceptable because he was he was everyone all of the American well I say the Americans I I sort of put myself in that the, all the all the non Indian guys he were out of all the Indian guys he was by far our favorite because Barood was like the only guy I think out of everyone there who was actually a wrestling fan and like actually wanted to be a wrestler like. And that's and he was good like he knew how to throw a working punch he could sell he had like fire and charisma he could bump so we all love we called him indian dusty because he was like a little mini dusty Rhodes. you know he had that sort of portly body and everything and he had like this real good baby face fire so the match that aired on tv with me and barood i actually had like a six or seven minute match with him and like sold shit like i sold a bunch for him so like the actual match was like, I get down on my knees and I'm like, blah, blah, blah. And he like hits me with a shot and I like feed up and I'm all, you know, I'm, I come around, I come charging, he ducks out the way and like fires up on me some more, like duck one, ducks another one, gets me with like a flying head scissors, like fires, you know, over the, uh, I'm selling for him, you know what I mean? Cause I'm not making, cause he, cause he, he deserved it. And like 
all the boys were like, yeah, Baroud, Baroud, you're the man, Baroud. I, I came back and the Indian guy, the Indian like executives were furious. <laughs> it was just like, why would you do this? Like, you know, like and then they cut it all out. They edited it all out. So oh. literally it's just me on the ground, like messing with him. And it's like, he hits me and I like, so, and then it cuts back and it's me <laughs> pinning him. And I was like, you're kidding me. We, we came back, I remember one day we came back from a day of taping, we came back to the hotel and he was sitting in the lobby on his laptop to get the Wi-Fi and was watching, like was studying matches, was watching like Kurt Angle and Eddie Guerrero and you know what I mean? And like watching stuff like, and we were just like, we like this guy, like, you know, cause all the rest of them were like, oh, I'm a TV star, like, you know, you know what the fuck you're doing? Uh, how old was he? I don't know. Probably, I mean, probably early 20s, I would have thought, you know, I mean, hard to say, but bless his heart. It was, he was, uh, yeah, he, he, he deserved, he deserved to do something because he, he was, and that's why, you know, we all, a lot of us went out of our way to try and sell for him. I mean, I wasn't the only one who sold for him and then it all got edited out. <laughs> the first kid that I wrestled, uh, Pagal, kid, the uh, bird dude, him and, I always see you like posting about um, Baroud, the big, the the dude that looks like a kid. Hit like him and I. Uh, those two guys were like super into everything. They uh, they wanted to wrestle all the time. As a matter of fact, one time when I got home, uh, Pogal called me. He doesn't speak any English, you know what I'm saying? And like he was just like. Uh, like, we want to come over there and work, you know what I mean? But I couldn't understand nothing he said. Uh, but anyway, those guys would always show up and work hard. I I was his first match ever. And we, you know, like, we had it on TV. And, uh, like, if you watch the match, like, I'm running around because he doesn't, you know, like, wrestling, you have to have, like, some natural movements, you know? But he was very... Um, just like robotic in his movements, you know what I mean? Like we we were trying to work hard with him though. You know what I mean? Like there was other guys that you know we wouldn't we wouldn't let them do all that stuff because they didn't know how to, but like we were really trying with him because you know he were he, he was showing that he wanted to do it. Did you did you know he didn't win a single match on the show? So that was all down to the executives, I take it. Of course, yeah. I mean, in their mind, they were like, because they would, you know, again, coming from that sort of non wrestling person point of view, they're just like, this guy's short and fat, like he couldn't be anyone, you know, like he, he's, a, he's a small, like, to your point, he's a small eight year old Indian boy. But he's also awesome. Um, yeah. Do you believe um, he could have a future in wrestling or do you think he's done? <laughs> he's not in Who knows? Who knows? The third show starts out with who else but Jeff Jarrett and Random Dudes Extreme. For some reason the lawyer is sweeping the ring with a brush. Jarrett said that there's been a lot of complaints about the lack of competitive matches on the show last week. Jarrett continues to threaten the cricket guy and calls him a coward. Jarrett says that there'll be a four team tag team match for the number one contendership tonight and next week there'll be a Royal Rumble with the winner getting a shot of Magnus in his belt. Jarrett also puts Mahabali Vera in a match against Chris Adonis. If he can't beat Adonis he won't be allowed in the Royal Rumble match. Suddenly, a homeless man appears on the ramp. We haven't seen him since he lost in the lethal lockdown match. The homeless man is after a title match again, even though he's done absolutely nothing apart from beat up an obese eight-year-old Indian child. The homeless man flips and beats everyone up with a broom. It doesn't last long and random dudes extreme beat him down. Abyss then hits him with a black hole slam. Suddenly, oh, I think I'm going to be sick. It's Samosa Joe getting in the ring. That is disgusting. Random dudes are in shock, a bit like I am. Steiner and the dudes bell because they don't like fat asses. The Bollywood boys and their banging theme music are out next. It's the four-way tag team match and next out is everyone's favourite, Joey Ryan and Nunzio. The next team are, yes, it's the fake Indian strongmen from Family Guy. These guys are on a bit of a winning streak, believe it or not. The fourth team are the Shakes. I'm not going to say it, alright? I already said it earlier on in this video. I don't care how these two guys are related. Shut up or I'll smack you one. 
These fake looking strongmen are so weird. I just don't understand this gimmick. There's a spot where everybody dives to the outside, but pretty much every dive that happens looks dodgy. Nunzio almost wins the match with Feymasa from the top. Then there's a tower spot involving three of the teams, but the Indian strongmen are not involved because they can't be trusted. The strongmen then randomly come into the match and start doing their stupid headbutt battering ram thing. The Bollywood boys then hit their double super kick to become the number one contenders. Everyone gets in the ring to celebrate, including the fake strongmen. Why are they so happy they lost? The little Indian man is backstage with the Rinka King lawyer. He looks like he could be Mahabali Shira's dad. Random dudes then walk into the office. I have no idea what they said, but Sanjay seems to think he's a badass when he's in India. Next up, the eight-year-old obese Indian boy is talking about how he's going to win the Royal Rumble match. He always looks like he's got 50 bogeys in his nose. Adonis is out for the main event of the show. This guy's done nothing but put me to sleep. And I'm not talking about the effects of the Master Lock. Mahabali Vera is his opponent. Finally, these two are going to have a one-on-one -on -one match. They've only been feuding for 20 episodes. They have a test of strength until Vera takes him off his feet. On the outside, Adonis slams him on the ground. Back in the ring, Adonis hits a suplex. This is already the longest match that Vera's ever been in. Vera eventually fights back and rolls Adonis up for a two count before getting clothesline straight back down. Adonis then tries to put on the Adonis lock, but Vera backs Adonis into the corner. Shira then gets involved on the outside and Adonis crashes into him. Mahabali Vera then hits a spine buster and pins Adonis for the free. This seems to be the start of his rise to the top of the company. Samosa Joe then appears on the ramp again. Thank God he has his robes on this time. I have no idea who this guy is or what he's doing, but he needs to go on a serious diet. They keep talking about the cricket guy, although he's barely been in these three episodes, thank God. Make no mistake, though, he's still the main character. The guys that were the taxi drivers. Oh, is that what? <laughs> you know the two guys? Is, is that what they were meant to be? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They were taxi drivers. Those are the guys that I almost got in a fight with. But, you know, like, they were... um. <laughs> They were like shoot wrestlers. They did in the Indian style of wrestling that they do in the sand or whatever. Like they were real strong guys, but like they were, they were so difficult to deal with. I thought they were, I thought they were supposed to be circus strongmen. I thought that was their gimmick. <laughs> taxi drivers. Maybe. Oh. Yeah, they kept telling us they were taxi drivers. Random dudes extreme start the show coming out with new ring gear that says I hate bargies. I don't think they're that bad personally. I think they go quite nicely with a garlic chili balti, but I can take it or leave it. Jarrett says that these t-shirts prove what a coward the cricket man is. How does it prove that? It just proves that you don't like getting a side order. The idiot abyss then starts punching a picture of the cricket guy and then he destroys it and shoves it in a barrel. Jarrett wants the cricket guy to sign a contract to fight him. Steiner then tips petrol in the barrel and then he sets it on fire. This is the sort of quality content that I watch this show for. I'm surprised someone didn't slam the idiot abyss into it, he'd probably feel right at home. The little Indian man is backstage with Mahabali Vera's dad, the lawyer. Suddenly Jazzy the jobber walks up. He lost a match to Jarrett in just a couple of minutes last week. Don't know what he said, but he's looking quite happy about it. The opening match tonight is Sanjay Dutt and his golden wings, and he's been accompanied by his best friend in the whole world, Magnus, and he will be taking on Jimmy. Don't let him near a mic rave. It's Jimmy Rave, and I'm ready to get this match over with so we can party! Woo! Yeah, I know, it's getting boring, but this series is almost over, so shut up or I'll smack you one. Sanjay Dutt is playing with the crowd and having lots of fun here. Sanjay keeps flying everywhere, it's like he has real wings or something, or maybe he drank some Red Bull before this match. Jimmy eventually catches him with a Russian leg sweep for a two. Jimmy then takes an embarrassing looking bump to the outside of the ring. I have no idea what he was doing, but guess too much partying? Sanjay is overly cocky in this match and it could cost him here. Sanjay tries to score a pinfall but he just eats a kick to the face for a two. Sanjay then tries to hit a springboard crossbody but misses. Sanjay then does hit a nice slingshot leg drop. Sanjay then decides to put on the golden wings and up he climbs to the top and surely not. <laughs> he beats Jimmy Rave while spending the whole match just messing around. The wings look like they're made out of paper for God's sake. Backstage, the Indian leather man tells Angelina Love that he wants to speak to her after the match, but a strange little man is seen watching from the corridor. The midget then runs up and tells her that he also wants to talk to her after a match. What a strange love triangle this is. Angelina Love then walks away and he stares at her ass and then... Whoa, what is he doing? What the hell? 
Raisha Saeed is out next and she's accompanied by the sheikhs, Sheikh Abdul and Aria Davari, who is Sheikh Abdul's grandfather. The commentary woman then screams out that it's time for the very lovable Angelina Love. Raisha jumps her straight away. The sheikhs keep getting involved so the referee sends the two friends to the back. Angelina Love then hits a huge crossbody from the top and nearly puts Raisha away. Angelina Love then hits the lights out and seconds later she gets the win. The match didn't really go for long, I guess she was in a hurry to talk to her two lovers. The leather man comes out but he's not wearing leather so I guess he needs a new nickname. He speaks in full Indian to her even though he knows she can't understand him. He then says he loves her and he wants to marry her. He starts begging her to marry him and gives her a rose. He keeps saying, marry please. The midget then charges out with his own flowers. He's got a bigger bunch than the leather man who looks annoyed. The two men then start arguing with each other and then the midget tells Angelina Love that he loves her. The two men are literally begging her. Angelina Love sneaks off as the midget starts stripping. Good timing. Backstage the little Indian man is with Angelina Love and he says that she must be flattered of all the attention that she's getting. Angelina says that she's very flattered and has always wanted an Indian wedding. Angelina Love says she can't decide who to marry but it will be happening on Rinka King. Why does she need to marry either of them to have an Indian wedding? What the hell? A cheap SUV pulls up backstage. No idea who it was, but it was never mentioned again. Mahabali Vera is out next for a battle royal. Only him, the American Adonis, Chavo, the Underfaker, and Matt Boring get their entrances shown. Have you ever seen such a group of wrestling jobbers and wasters? Wait, some more music hits. It's Samosa Joe. Samosa Joe is in the Rinka King zone. Samosa Joe is entering the battle royal. Wait, no he's not, he just stands there like an idiot. This is for the number one contendership for the world title. Boring throws the Mumbai cats out straight away. He then chucks out Nunzio. The eight year old obese Indian boy then throws out Joey Ryan. <laughs> That's gotta be his biggest claim to fame. The fake UFC fighter is thrown out next. What a night for the boy, two eliminations. The fake Indian strongman, Nick Dinsmore and Sofatio Vega are thrown out next. <laughs> They're all eliminated by the boy. Why? Adonis then throws out the boy. That's a shame, I wanted him to win. The fake Hawk then tries to do some cruiserweight moves, so Adonis chucks him out. Zima Ion is thrown out next. Take a look at the ring right now. This shows how much they valued the Indian talent. It's literally just Mahabali Vera left. Vera looks knackered, I'm not sure why, it's been about two minutes. The Underfaker tries to slingshot Chavo out the ring, but he skins the cat. Chavo then knocks out Adonis. I don't know why he sold it like that. He looks like he's making fun of Chavo, just like I do. The four men brawl for ages. The big boys eventually launch Chavo out the ring. Adonis then chucks the Underfaker out. Vera hits the Vera bomb and then he knocks Adonis out of the ring. He is now the number one contender for the world title. What was the point in Samosa Joe being there? He did absolutely nothing. The cricket guy is out next. He picks up the contract and signs it on the back of Samosa Joe's back. There you go. He does have a purpose. As a table. It's over. That was a quick hour. Great show. Show 2 starts out with a triple threat. Raisha Saeed, who for some reason isn't with her shakes, will be taking on Alicia Flash and the very lovable Angelina Love. Now obviously Alyssa Flash and Raisha Saeed are the same wrestler, so it must be Joey Ryan or some other male wrestler who has a feminine-like body portraying Raisha Saeed here. The two heels team up on Angelina. In fact Raisha is even happy for Alyssa to try and pin Angelina. They eventually decide that they want to both win the match and start fighting. Angelina then takes out both of them. Alyssa then hits a top rope drop kick on Raisha and then Angelina rolls her up for the free. Angelina is the winner but the announce doesn't call her lovable this time. The Indian leather man comes up next carrying a red cloth which contains three jewellery boxes. He gives it to Angelina, she seems quite impressed with it. The Indian leather man obviously has some sort of money. How else could he afford those fake Ray-Bans? The midget then comes out and he starts pointing out that he has better bling than the leather man. He gives a key to Angelina and drags her away. The leather man is in complete shock. The midget leads Angelina up the ramp to her gift and as the gift is unveiled it leads to the smallest red pickup truck I have ever seen. What? Why would she want a pickup truck? Does Angelina Love look like the type of woman who needs a pickup truck? She's the sort who gets someone else to do her hard work. I think Rinka King had some sort of sponsorship with the red truck company, but it's such a desperate way to try and squeeze in a plug. It doesn't even make sense. Because the show was sponsored by Tata Trucks. Oh, right. <laughs> so it was like they had to find product placement. That's why in every episode there was some random pre-tape. That's why in that pre-tape with like Angelina and the and the the the, the lover guy, like he's like driving the little because <laughs> it was like they had to have product placement for these Tata trucks. <laughs> we were just like it just became a rib, you know, like Jim's like, oh, we gotta figure out a way to get a truck in the show. Hey, <laughs> Angel, 
y'all can come in on a truck. Like, <laughs> she'd be like, what? Okay. You know, like, like they took us to the big uh, car factory, the Tata car factory. You know, and we went and like, I've got this picture of me and Zima and the Bollywood boys. And they took us to a, like a, a school that's where all the, the factory workers, kids go to school. And like, there's just like tons of kids around us and shit like that. And, uh, you know, like if you would have asked us, like the way that we were being treated, like we would have been there forever. The cricket guy is out next. Man, this crowd are crazy for this guy. The cricket guy calls out Jeff Jarrett, who brings random dudes extreme with him. The guy tells Jarrett something about the contract that Jeff is livid about. The cricket guy starts getting cocky and calls Jeff a coward and tells him to sign it, which he does. Samosa Joe then comes out. You're not needed as a table. We've already signed the contract, Samosa Joe. The cricket guy tells random dudes if any of them interfere in the match, they'll have to deal with Samosa Joe and his fat ass. The main event tonight is a tag title match. The Bollywood boys and their banging theme music come out to challenge. Okay. Do you know what always confused me about their entrance? None of the women dancing with them are Indian. They all look like white chicks from strip clubs. So what did TNA do? Ship them over from the States? Or does India have strip clubs filled with white dancers? You tell me. How did these random women get on the show? That's what I want to know. Steiner and Abyss come out to defend their tag belts and they are accompanied by the Indian big boss man. Steiner doesn't really seem interested in defending his belt and charges into the crowd. The Bollywood boys take the fight to them in the crowd. I love seeing these charging crowds, it's such a good visual. Steiner and Abyss try to get into the ring and then the Bollywood boys hit them with baseball slides. The bell finally rings to start the match. Random dudes instantly deck them with clotheslines. The boys take out Steiner and then they just kind of hit him with their body and then they drop kick him out of the ring. The Bollywood boys then hit a double dive to the outside. One of the Bollywood boys tries to jump from the top and Abyss tries to go for a choke slam, so he just bites him to fight it off. Steiner then clubs him in the back so random dudes get back on top of the match. Steiner hits a belly to belly but doesn't want the match to end yet. He then hits a Steiner line and the boy tries to get up so Steiner pushes him back down so he can do his elbow drop push up gimmick. The short haired boy keeps arguing with the referee and screwing his own partner over. Steiner then proceeds to beat the long haired one so hard in the corner that his nose gets busted open the hard way. Damn. Abyss and Steiner then have some miscommunication and the short haired one manages to get the tag. The long haired boy hits a top rope drop kick for a two. Steiner then tries to throw one of them but they hit another drop kick to stop him. The boys then hit a drop kick to Abyss and a back elbow from the top rope. The boys then dive to the outside with a pair of elbows. These boys are flying all over the arena tonight. Steiner doesn't seem happy about this and boots the short haired one in the ribs. Steiner hits a flat liner and then puts the long haired one in the Steiner recliner. As he's about to tap out, the lights go out. As the lights come back on, Mahabali Vera is in the ring with a stick and he hits both of them with it. The boys then super kick Steiner out of the ring. They then hit another kick to Abyss and they both climb on top of him and pin him for the free. The Bollywood boys and their banging theme music are the new tag team champions. I wondered how they were going to take the belts off Steiner. This is one of the only ways I knew it was ever going to happen. So as I said, a bit of a shorter one today, but I'm a bit strapped for time and I wanted to make one final episode on Rinka King. I know, I'm disappointed. The eight-year-old obese Indian boy only had one brief spell on this video, but he did manage to throw Joey Ryan out of a battle royal. So he's got that going for him. That was probably the biggest highlight of his career. So to the boy, wherever you are, we all know about your achievements. And if you think the boy should have won the battle royal, you can shove it. We'd be at the, we'd be at the studio and they might have like a talent meeting, just go, okay, okay, you know, this is like, if you have pyro, you know, they, they have to do, do a lot of things to sort of make sure everyone, you know, to go through like production notes and stuff. And, um, and we were like looking around the ring and a lot of the Indian guys were standing around like holding hands with each other. And we'd be kind of like, huh, oh, it's weird. And it was again, after what, like, after a day or two, like one of our handlers explained to us, like, no, in Indian culture, like, that's just like what buddies do. It's like the equivalent of like high fiving, sort of thing, you know, like, uh, there's so many little things like that that just, it's like being on another planet, you know, because it's like, I was, and I, you know, we would sit there, we would sit there sort of, um, pontificating this going like, do you think that they see us like high-fiving each other and go oh gay you know like <laughs> because we're like we're sort of looking at these like guys holding hands going like are they gay and they're like no no they're not gay 
what did you think of the Indian cuisine out there yourself? I fucking hated it. Like, I, I don't do spicy food, you know? And, uh, like, I was going nuts. I brought a whole bunch of my own food. Jovit Squad, you can all breathe a sigh of relief after this video. If your girl's still with you at this point, you can count your blessings. But make sure you put her out for the night because I'm about to make her sing. For the final time ever, it's Rinka King. Random dudes are backstage receiving a lecture from Supreme Leader Jeff Jarrett. Sanjay looks like your little kid brother sat on the couch. The Underfaker is also there. Jarrett says that he has one problem left in his life, and it's the homeless man. The homeless man? We haven't seen him for about two videos. How is he still a problem? I'd assumed he'd given up on being a wrestler at this point and gone back to the slums of Ahmedabad to beg for his dinner at this point. Mahabali Vera comes out to talk about how much he loves the cricket guy and he hopes that he beats up Jeff Jarrett. He's then interrupted by the best friends in the world, Magnus and Sanjay Dutt. He doesn't have the wings with him though. Magnus says that as an Englishman, it's his right to tell the Indian people to shut their mouths. He then makes fun of Vera. Why is he sweating so much? He's barely even moved at this point. Is he ill or something? Vera then attacks the random dude's lawyer and takes out the best friends in the world. He poses with the world title belt whilst the commentary team nearly reached the point of climax. Backstage, Matt Morgan is kissing the cricket guy's ass. This show has really made me hate the both of them. The little interviewer man is in a hotel room somewhere with the very lovable Angelina Love, who says that next week we will get to see her wedding. The midget then runs up and spends about 30 seconds talking in Hindi whilst Angelina looks confused. The little interviewer man then translates it for us. Don't look at the size of my height, look at the size of my heart. And I think that's a moral we can all live by. Back on the show, the Mumbai Cats, who are the young bucks before they made it, and they're coming out for a tag match against everybody's favourite, Joey Ryan and Nunzio. The Sheiks are already in the ring, and they don't get their entrances shown. The next team do get their entrances shown. It's my new favourite team. It's the obese eight-year-old Indian boy and the fake UFC fighter. Why did they get their entrances shown over the other teams? I'm honestly going to miss this guy when it's over. The boy starts out with some close pins on Sheik Abdul, but only gets the two. Bashir then tries to suplex him, but the boy is too fat. The boy then shakes his boobs with happiness and hits a scoop slam. He then follows it up with a splash. That must have really hurt. The UFC fighter then gets in, but he's not really very good. Look at those punches. Why does he keep shaking? Has he got Parkinson's? I don't know. Then he does a terrible looking splash, and then there's an obvious cut where some footage had to be taken out from him screwing up. The bad guys eventually isolate one of the Mumbai cats and Aria Davari, who is Sheikh Abdul Bashir's grandmother, hits a neck breaker. The eight-year-old obese Indian boy then gets the hot tag and he nails a spine buster for a two. The match then breaks down and the boy hits a northern light suplex on Aria Davari. It's impressive for him, but I don't think anybody taught him how to do the pinning part of the move. Aria Davari kicks out at two. The boy then climbs to the top. Don't do it! Don't do it! You're gonna hurt yourself! Ooh, he shakes his boobs at the crowd and then he tries to hit a swanton bomb, but he misses. <laughs> and he loses again. The obese boy has never won a match and he thought he could hit a swanton bomb? What an idiot. The crowd are in complete silence. Some of them have their head in their hands. Angelina Love is backstage considering the midget's proposal when the Indian leather man walks up and gives her a rose. He tells her that he loves her. Then the midget walks up and serenades her. The midget starts kissing Angelina's hand whilst looking at the leather man and snarling at him. I don't know what to think. The homeless man is in a poorly lit corridor talking about a championship match before he's taken off screen by the Underfaker. Presumably he's dead. We never ever see him again on Ring King, and to this day I'm still wondering what happened. The Underfaker comes out to the ring on his big wheels. The homeless man's music hits, but he's nowhere to be seen. Instead of the homeless man, out walks the eight-year-old obese Indian boy. <laughs> I love this show so much. Why is it always him? He gets in the ring and starts shaking his boobs at the crowd for some reason. Look at the size difference. This is ridiculous. The boy does a 10 punch boob shake in the corner. Underfaker then floors him. The boy learns how to do a forward roll in this match, which is probably the most impressive move he's ever done. Within two minutes, the Underfaker hits a choke bomb and pins him for the free. Why always him? After the match, the Underfaker continues the attack and tries to hit a choke slam, but he can barely get the boy up. The Bollywood boys come out to make the save, whilst the fake Indian strongmen from Family Guy are on the outside of the ring bouncing up and down with happiness. They then all dance to the Bollywood boys and their banging theme music. Make some 
So Mesa Joe struggles out to the ring next. His boobs are some of the largest I've ever seen. Jeff Jarrett and Random Dudes Extreme come out next, but he tells them that he doesn't need them. This is the match that you've all been waiting for. This is what Ring King has been building to this whole time. It's the cricket guy versus slap nuts in a blindfold match. So Mesa Joe is guarding the ring and has his hands on his hips like a Tito Ortiz debut. The crowd are fully behind the cricket guy chanting Bargy. The cricket guy gets the mic and tells slap nuts this could be his last night in India. The crowd are going absolutely berserk for this guy. They look like they're having strokes from the excitement. It turns out that only Jarrett has to be blindfolded in this match. This is why the random dude's lawyer was so upset a couple of shows ago. Mahabali Vera comes into the ring and they show a replay in case you forgot what happened five seconds ago. I'm not sure why they show a replay for this. Vera then starts punching Jarrett. I think the commentary team say that this is a no DQ match. Vera then hits the Vera bomb and the cricket guy pins Jarrett for the free. It went about 20 seconds. Wow, what a waste of time. They've literally spent 25 shows building towards this rubbish. I wanted to see the cricket guy get the stroke or at least get hurt. The cricket guy is now acting all cocky after the match, but it's not as if he actually did anything. We'll have to wait and find out if that's it for this feud. Show one is over. This second one is going to be a big one. It sounds like Vera is challenging for Magnus's world title. Jarrett walks in to threaten Jazzy Lahoria as his fat face swells up with anger. Suddenly a huge flabby paw appears on Jarrett's hand. It's Samosa Joe and he's cuffed the two of them together. Next up, oh for God's sake, I cannot cope. Dr. Nick Dinsmore and the obese eight-year-old Indian boy are sat in the ring smiling. He looks so strange in a blue t-shirt, but he looks happy. The Indian leather man comes out. Why is Dinsmore and the boy here? Surely they can't be the best men. I don't know, I don't know what the Hindi marriage culture is, do I? The midget comes out to join the proceedings. Look at this ring set. We've seen some bizarre wrestling weddings in our time, but this might take the cake. Angelina Love comes out, but she's not in her normal attire. I wonder who she's going to pick. She has a wreath of flowers to put around the one that she wants to choose. She eventually decides on the midget. The leather man is in complete shock. Why doesn't he just leave? Why does he hang around and watch? Dinsmore and the boy are throwing flowers as they walk around the ring. They are then declared married. I wish English weddings were this simple. I'd rather walk around in a circle having things chucked at me by an obese boy than stand in a cold damp church having an old man chant Bible gibberish at me for an hour. They then all start dancing. The leather man looks like he's dying. Dinsmore gives him some pills. I think I'm going to take some too. It's over. Next up is a four-way ladder match with the Golden Wings title on the line. It's Zima Ion versus the Fake Hawk. I'm interested to see how he gets on here. Versus Jimmy, don't let him near a mic rave. It's Jimmy Rave and I'm ready to get this match over with so we can party! Woo! Versus the champion, Sanjay Dutt. All of the three good guys team up on Sanjay and then they hit a triple drop kick as he dives from the top. Double Flapjack takes out the Fake Hawk. Jimmy takes another silly looking bump in this match as well. This sets up Zima Ion to dive on top of him. Zima gets the first ladder but the Hawk slides it into him. Sanjay then takes the fake hawk out with a ladder. Jimmy and Sanjay do a silly looking spot with a ladder. It just doesn't look very realistic to me. Zima Ion then back body drops Jimmy Rave onto a ladder. Zima then goes to get the wings, but the fake hawk springs into the ring and kicks Zima off the ladder. Shades of AJ Styles there. Fake hawk then climbs the ladder, but Sanjay Dutt suplexes him from it. Zima then tries to take control, but Hawk drop toe holds him onto the ladder. Sanjay then attacks him and takes him out on the outside. Zima and Jimmy get pushed off the ladder by Sanjay. He then tries to win his wings back, but the fake hawk springs onto the ladder again. They then start brawling at the top, but the hawk knocks Sanjay off. The hawk gets the wings, and we have a new Golden Wings champion. It's the fake hawk. I think this is a very suitable belt for him. Probably one of the best matches I've seen throughout Rinka King. The little Indian man is backstage trying to interview Jarrett about the title match tonight, but he's still cuffed to Samosa Joe, who's eating six plates of food. They then tell Samosa Joe that he has to leave his food behind, as it's time for the world title match. The Cricket Giant and Samosa Joe come out, pulling Jarrett behind them. Vera comes out next to challenge for the world title. Magnus is the last champion in Random Dude's Extreme, and I have a feeling he's going to be losing that belt here. It's a slow, clunky match as expected. Magnus slowly beats up Vera as I try to stay awake. Magnus hits a backbreaker and a knee drop but doesn't pin him. Magnus hits the weakest looking elbow drop from the top and Vera kicks out. It literally had zero impact. I'm watching this slow clunky match and all I can think is that I wish it had been Scott Steiner in Magnus' position. I'm planning on getting some interviews with a wrestler who took part in Rinky King. It still bothers me that they turned on the Scott Steiner main event run. Anyway, I'm rambling because this match is boring. 
Vera hits a clothesline and a back body drop for a two. Vera then goes for a splash in a corner, but Magnus pulls the referee in the way. He then hits a suplex on Vera. Magnus grabs his belt from the outside, but the cricket guy stops him from using it. Vera then hits the Vera bomb, and it's over. Where were Steiner and Abyss? Vera wins his first world title in India, and he's still incredibly green, but the Indian crowd love him here. After the match, Jarrett gets on the mic. Oh, there's Abyss and Steiner. Jarrett says next week, everybody who's not a member of his faction will be a dead man. That was a good episode. I can't believe I'm about to watch the final episode of Rinka King. Sad times. Okay, let's do it for the last time. Episode 26, how does it all end? Apologies for the video quality on this one, it's the best I could do. Random Dudes Extreme start out the show. It wouldn't be Rinka King without Scott Steiner attacking the crowd members, now would it? Jarrett says tonight his faction will burn Rinka King to the ground. There will be a 10 man tag match, Random Dudes versus the Rinka King guys. Jarrett also challenges the cricket guy to another fight. And the 10 man tag match is first. Every single wrestler has their own entrance. This could take a while. It's the Indian big boss man, Sanjay Dutt, Magnus, the idiot Abyss and Scott Steiner. Hang on. I've just had a thought. All of these guys were just in the ring a moment ago for a promo. Why send them all to the back and then bring them straight out again? There was literally nothing in between. Representing Team Rinka King is the cowboy Trevor Murdoch, the fake Hawk. Wow, didn't expect to see him in this one. He's getting a good push. On a side note, he's probably come off the best during this entire series. Of course, Eddie's nephew has to be on the team. Matt Boring is also on the team. During his entrance, you can see crowd members scrambling away from Steiner attacking them. The final member of Rinka King is the world champion Vera. Boredom Hart is conspicuous by his absence. Jesus, Steiner is determined to kill a crowd member tonight. This is chaos, the 10 men are fighting everywhere. Some wrestlers start fighting in the ring, but Steiner's still in the crowd at this point. Chavo is the one that the Hills decide to isolate. After a very long time, Eddie's nephew powerbombs Sanjay and makes the tag to Matt Boring. The match breaks down and everyone starts doing moves. Chavo takes out everyone on the outside. This leaves the Indian big boss man in the ring with Vera who bombs him for the free. The little Indian man is in the middle of the road when Angelina Love and the Midget drive up in their little red pickup truck with Samosa Joe in the back for some weird reason. It can barely move and it sounds like it's about to break down. They then recount the cricket guy and Jeff Jarrett's feud for five minutes in case you forgot. Jarrett comes out on his own next. The cricket guy comes out with a cricket wicket. Jarrett has his guitar in hand and it doesn't look like either of these two are backing down. They both finally put the weapons down. Jarrett keeps running away because he's scared of the cricket guy for some reason. He tries to leave up the ramp but Samosa Joe is there to stop him. Joe forces him to go back to the ring. Random dudes then come out and Samosa Joe beats them all up and they run away. Jarrett and the cricket guy start pushing each other around and the cricket guy eventually knocks Jarrett over. Jarrett tries to punch him but the cricket guy dodges and starts skipping like Shane O'Mac. The cricket guy starts slamming Jeff in the corner and Jarrett collapses. He then tears Jarrett's t-shirt off that says I hate onion bargies and starts choking Jarrett with it. The lights then go out. Random dudes are in the ring and they have the cricket guy. He's finally going to get his comeuppance. Jarrett has his guitar in hand. Do it! Hit him! Hit him! Team Rinka King run out to make the save. Oh for God's sake. Jarrett smashes Vera over the head with his guitar. The cricket guy then beats up every single member of random dudes with his cricket wicket. The Underfaker then appears on the ramp with all the belts in his hands and gives them back to the random dudes, including the Golden Wings. Random dudes then run outside and climb aboard a red truck. Well, it wouldn't be a blue one, would it? They climb all over the back of it and then the truck drives off. The show's over. Jarrett would never get his comeuppance because Rinka King wasn't renewed for another series, so the cricket guy never got hit. On the final episode of Rinka King, you... <laughs> You were drove up on the back of a lorry. <laughs> you stole the belts and you all stood on the back of a lorry. Right. What was the, it, was it meant to come back for a second series? Was there a plan for I think that it was, was a... I think it was, I think it was because there was no plan that Jeff decided this is the best way to leave it open-ended. Like, did, I mean, I just, <laughs> But why, why, why did we do I don't understand. <laughs> Very slowly drove away on a truck. Like, it was like that episode of The Simpsons where they're like, damn, they're very slowly getting away. <laughs>
it was so hard to ride on the back of that truck. Like it was the most undignified grand entrance I've ever like. We, we, we're all standing there. Bearing in mind, we're all wearing these like weird shoes and like got all this weird shit on. Like how they managed to get Scott to do that. And uh, like <laughs> Steiner man just standing there, just like I just remember like we're all trying to stand there looking cool. And then every time the truck would even move a little bit, we're like, you know, the original plan was for us to do that in different markets. Oh, really? Because yeah, we were like uh I think the the next one was supposed to be like Argentina or something like that. Because it, like Endermall is a, like a just a big production company. And so that's what they, you know, they did Big Brother. Because they're the production company that did that. And so like they would start it say, in India. And if it did well, they'll take it to the UK and then the US, you know, and like that's what originally it was supposed to do. For some reason, a lot of people want to know what happened to the belts. Have you got any idea where they went? We never touched them. No. Like, we, once they were done, they, we just gave them back. They were just like props for their TV show. My favorite, the thing, the one thing I, the, the thing I really, tr I tried to do, but got, but got busted was I really tried to keep, I tried to keep all that garb that I wore in that coronation thing. <laughs> remember, remember we came in on the back of the truck? <laughs> <laughs> So, Why? <laughs> so stupid. The dude stole all the belts, but the bigger question that we all continue to ask until the end of eternity is what on earth happened to the obese eight-year-old Indian boy? My favourite character on this entire series. Well, I do have one final extra to include that might help give some of you some closure. In 2017, TNA held two shows in India, and look who we have here. It's the fake Hawk competing against Davy Richards, although he no longer has the Hawk gimmick. It's just a job match, but it's good to see him again. He was supposed to join Impact Wrestling with the Desi Hit Squad, but it didn't happen for some reason. It's about to get even better though. The Hawk never disappoints in making your girl sing when we're watching wrestlers from Rinka King. Here's Josh Matthews. Josh is on the mic making fun of his opponent for tonight. He makes some very strange comments about his opponent, and he comes out. Here he is, it's Sandeep Devan. Or as you all know him, oh my god. It's the eight-year-old obese Indian boy, and the boy has grown up now. He has a beard. It's another job match. Matthews hits him with the Swanton Bomb. He then puts the boy in the Steiner recliner, and the boy taps out. So the boy has still never won a match, and losing one to Josh Matthews is about as embarrassing as it gets. So I hope that all gave you a bit of closure. Rinka King, I'm really going to miss you. I wish wrestling nowadays could be as fun as this show was. You've all been great. Thank you for your support in this series. Thank you so much and good night. Have you heard about NXT India? No. It, is that... Do they just start that? It hasn't started yet, but it's been announced. Um, and apparently Jeff Jarrett's going to have something to do with it. Yeah. Uh, I'm real good friends with Steve Carino. And I, like, I know they were about to buy uh, Noah in Japan to do NXT in Japan. Um, but like they want to do that everywhere that they've, you know, they want to do the one in China, everywhere that they go and do tryouts, you know, their hope is to do that. Certainly one of my favorite, like most significant experiences in my career, like overall, like it's one of those things where anytime it gets brought up, I just get the biggest smile on my face. And I'm just like, I've got so many stories, so many like, so many made so many friends so many great memories and it was such a short period of time it was so random so stupid but like yeah i just loved it it was the best i'm pretty sure that brood like still does wrestling over there like i'm friends with him on facebook and i see him doing shit um you know, the midget guy i think he could have made it <laughs> i heard some magnus told me a funny story about him <laughs> messing with chris masters oh yeah he <laughs> dude he was he was awesome. He he used to do this thing after he, like you'd shake his hand and he would like kiss his fingers and go like that every time. Like I he was like a legit movie guy though. Wow. Like he's in movies and shit. I'm friends with him on Facebook too. Like he's always in movies and all this shit. Like but he uh but I liked him. He I thought he was cool. Like um I really thought the the dude with the afro 
I I thought they were trying to bring him over from for TNA, um, and they were going to stick him in OVW. That's what they kept saying. Uh, I think he could have, um, because like if that trans that character could have translated to, you know, United States TV. Like I like I'm a big fan of like, um, like Memphis TV. Yeah. Like uh, you know, like when they debut Kamala, and it, you know, like he's coming out of the swamp and shit. Yeah. Like I'm I'm a fan of that stuff, and I think with him, he could have just been this crazy guy that nobody knows anything about and i think he could have he could have done it but could have like a Baruch, story yeah i think Baruch's like the one that you know for a us crowd could have just you know been good right there <laughs>